Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello everyone, welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, this is your host, Royce the Redneck uh, Radio Man, and joining me today is Mr. Ron Watson, and we're going to be discussing his book, The Greatest Story Never Told, and this book really caught my attention over on Amazon uh, when I was reading the description of it, because it goes into detail about a lot of things about the early church that's not exactly common knowledge, but I've done some research on myself, and I know that he's right about this, and it's stuff that it's a, what's a favorite topic of mine, and I always love to give anybody that knows something about this a chance to come out here and share. And I've also seen a YouTube video of the man, and it really impressed me. It was either YouTube or one of the other videos. I can't remember which because when I saw it, it was like a month or two ago when I first scheduled him. Uh, my show being scheduled two months in advance at the minimum right now for uh, I can forget a video between now and then. Um, but why don't we introduce him and let him tell us what got his interest in this. And the man's also in astrology, and I'm not certain if he planned on doing any uh, readings or uh, anything of that nature tonight. Uh, but if somebody calls in, you can always ask and see what he says. So, Ryan, I want to thank you for coming to the show tonight. It's a real pleasure to meet you and have you here. Well, it's my pleasure to be there, and I uh, really thank you for inviting me. And um, I look forward to a lively discussion on the subject of the book and uh, astrology, mythology, and scriptures. Essentially, that's what I um, lecture and teach on. Well, you know, I'm going to have a guest coming up at the end of this month. I got his description on the front page already. Uh, Malik Jebar, I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And if I'm not, I hope you don't get mad at me. But he's got some books out that talks about um, the astrological foundation of Christianity. So I didn't know if maybe you uh, had some knowledge in that part of it, too, as well. Um, that's what I lecture and teach on, and that's what my book's about. Um, most people don't realize how much um, astrology is in the scriptures. Most people, in fact, the Christian community uh, would have you believe that it's um, uh, anti-Christian to be into astrology or to look into it or to even uh, involve yourself with it. But uh, they have suppressed for you uh, the knowledge, but it's still there. And if you've got eyes to see and ears to hear, you can still discern what the early Christians were trying to tell us. Um, I can give you some simple scriptures that uh, can make that clear. Um, nearly in the Old Testament, it said the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Now, Sisera was a captain in the army, uh, and he lost the battle. Now, I, I, I don't know how you can write something such as the stars in their courses fought against him if they have no influence. Um, in Genesis, it said that he created the sun, the moon, the stars for signs. And for seasons, not just for seasons, but for signs and for seasons. Uh, Joseph, um, his brothers hated him so much, uh, because, uh, uh, they, they, uh, saw that he was a practitioner of these, um, uh, metaphysical subjects. He, in fact, um, was not only an interpreter of dreams, which, uh, uh, preserved the Pharaoh of Egypt eventually, uh, but he also, uh, the, the scripture says that the stars bowed down in obeisance to him, meaning that he understood them and he interpreted them and he understood them. Um, if you go into uh, the Psalms, it says the sun shall not smite thee uh, by day nor the moon by night. Well, I've heard of uh, sunstroke. I've never heard of moonstroke. But, uh, you know, I don't know how the moon can smite thee if, uh, if it has no influence. So we could keep on doing this. Uh, there's a scripture in Psalms that says... Uh, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And the original intention and translation of that word, uh, that sentence was not the heavens, it was the planets declare the glory of God and the heavens showeth his handiwork. And then it went on to say, and night unto night showeth knowledge and day unto day uttereth speech. And there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And moreover, in keeping them is their great reward and by them is thy servant warned. So, what is that? You know, it says that there's no voice or language where their voice is not heard. Astrology is the only universal language. It spoke to the same, pretty much the symbols are knowledgeably 
understood in every country of the world, not just in this country. So, you know, I can talk to an Indian astrologer. He may use a different uh, uh, system, a sidereal system, where I'll use a tropical, but we still understand each other very well when we talk astrology. Uh-huh. Uh, and so, anyway, so we could do this uh, for hours. There's so much astrology. And when, when we get to the most vital part of this is that the early Christians, if they understood what they're reading in the New Testament, they would be... Uh, have no choice but to uh, embrace astrology. First of all, um, I say to people that reject astrology, I say they probably would have ran the three wise men out of town when they were around, if they were there then, because the three wise men were astrologers. Yeah, I've read that. And so, you know, they they, they interpreted the books of Magi, but the actual original intent was astrologers, and they followed the star. Of course they followed the star, but they didn't follow a star in the sky. They had the astrological chart of the child, and they knew he'd be born in a propitious time in a particular place. And that star was the five-pointed star <laughs> inside of a chart of a child. It wasn't a star in the sky. That's why here it said he looked for it for two years. He couldn't find it. So um, what the Christians will do, they'll turn astrology um, against um, against astrology by saying, well, if it hadn't been for the wise men, um, uh, Herod wouldn't have slew all the children under two years old. Um, you know, so they'll try to make some problem with that was he was planning to do it before the wise men come along. Oh, it's sure. If he knew a leader was going to rise up, he was going to do that. So there's so much here. In fact, um, um, I'll give you some more scriptures. Uh, we could do this all night, but I'll give you well, some more scriptures. I was going to say before we go into that, though, uh, why don't you real quick, like, tell everybody what was it that kind of got your interest in this particular subject? Oh, great. That's a long one. Um, well, <laughs> let me, I'm very frank, I'm very outspoken, and I'm very um, upfront about how I ended up where I am. Okay. Um, I, started, I, started, I started studying astrology um, and spent um, really nine solitary years studying it uh, in, in a modesty existence. Um, what happened was in my early 20s, um, 50 years ago, to give you some idea of my age, um, 50 years ago, um, uh, I was the most wanted man in the United States. I was wanted in New York, Maryland, Virginia, Ohio, Texas, and Michigan for armed robberies. And I was a pretty wild, crazy young kid and um, got myself in a deep amount of trouble in the early period of my life. And uh, uh, for that, I ended up spending nine years in prison. <clears throat> in those nine years, I remember... Uh, when I went in, I recall they gave me a psychological test and they asked uh, questions such as a father uh, or my father, and then they would say a mother, and, that's, and another one was this place. And you were supposed to fill in whatever came to your mind when you uh, saw these things. And I put, I remember writing, my father is dead, because I never knew my real father. And then I wrote, a mother is a woman who suffers from the fruits of her pleasure. Um, because my mother was married nine times and didn't want to be a mother, and she obviously didn't want to raise me and my my sister. So, you know, and but the thing that I did write that was quite interesting was um, uh, probably a prescience of knowledge in deep in my soul that I knew why I was there. And when it came to the words "this place," I remember writing, "This place reminds me of a monastery." So I think in my deeper soul of my being, even though I had no religious concepts or thoughts of religion, I was pretty much a, I don't know, as agnostic or atheistic, it doesn't matter, but I, I surely didn't have a belief system that monitored anything. I was pretty lost. Um, but I must have at some point in my being known that this was going to be a monastic existence for me and that it was going to serve a larger purpose uh, than it was just to go to prison. And so I spent nine years in prison, and during those years, um, I studied astrology. Um, I didn't start out that way. I, I went in there, and there was a um, there was a beautiful black man named Percy John Newton, who um, did my chart, and he knew so much about me. I was just shocked. I couldn't believe anybody could do that with a chart. And, uh, and then what happened was um, um, I had a friend that lived in Virginia who. Uh, um, had a baby. She was a uh, very young girl, 17 years old, married to a um, uh, not not very good person, uh, a guy that was a, a alcoholic and abusive. And um, 
she did the chart of the baby when it was born because she sent me uh, the young girl sent me her uh, birth chart of the birth time of the child. As it turns out, <clears throat> he wrote on the calendar, uh, the mother of the child will die within six days of the birth of this child. And uh, I really didn't believe it. But because, but I thought possibly the child who was born premature might might not live, but I didn't really think about the mother. And as it turned out, um, literally six days to the hour and the minute, the mother died of an asthma attack while in the hospital, not being treated for her asthma. And she died six days to the minute and hour of that birth of that child, exactly as he foretold it. So that's when I really began to look at astrology. I said, there's more to this than anyone I've ever seen. I, I, I was one of these young people that thought I knew it all. And, um, you know, I, I'd read in the dictionary, it's a pseudoscience. So, of course, I just wrote it off as being nothing to it. But that put me on the journey, Royce, and that's where I stayed for nine solid through the years. I studied. I had a captive clientele. Nobody went anywhere. So I was able to, and I have plenty of time. So I, I spent hours and hours every day studying and researching. And out of those uh, nine years when I was released uh, in 1972, uh, I wrote the book for the next year. Um, and uh, I had really discovered a lot of amazing mystery uh, mysteries that had never been revealed, and I really understood that uh, uh, that I had tapped into some knowledge that had been kept from the masses, and uh, that put me on the journey. And I've had a wonderful life since then. I've uh, I've hosted my own radio shows for years in San Francisco, San Diego, and Los Angeles. Uh, had syndicated radio talk shows all over the United States. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, I was vice president of a major corporation in this country. I've done very well. I've been successful. But those those nine years were where my astrology came from. So that's what you get for asking. <laughs> well, do you still do your radio shows, though? You know, I don't now. Um, we moved to Florida two years ago, and uh, uh. we moved to yeah, we moved to Boston actually. Um, um, uh, about nine years ago, we spent six years in Boston, then we moved here. So I've kind of dislocated from California and, and stopped doing the shows. But, you know, I really have a uh, – I do a lot of lecturing and teaching. I just gave a lecture last week to the Theosophical Society in Miami here. And, um, you know, I have a love for sharing and, um, and spreading the truth because I really have uh, found that people, if once they understand the profundity – of the knowledge and what's coming and the ages and what they're about and how we're now entering the Aquarian age. Uh, you know, people talk about this, but, you know, the Aquarian age is the age of knowledge. Right. I remember, They're spoken you know, I about remember. in the Bible about that he'll pour out his spirit in those days. I think Amos said it, didn't he? Um, actually, um, in Matthew it says that. It says, uh, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I think it was in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's what I thought I, thought I remembered. Yeah, it is. It is. Yes, you're right. Uh, Joel, I think you're right. Yeah. And the the thing is that I, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old, old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And upon my hand, meaning too, in those days, I'll pour out my spirit, and they too shall prophesy. But the other part of that scripture that's overlooked very often is another scripture that says, in the last days, not only will I pour out my spirit, but it says, when the sign of the Son of Man appears in heaven. Which will be the sign of Aquarius. Exactly, the sign of the man. The only sign in the zodiac of a man is Aquarius. There's the Gemini, there's the twins, there's uh, my sign, uh, Sagittarius, which is half horse and half man, uh, when it's not half ass and half man. But <laughs> anyway, so there's only really one sign of a man, and he's pouring out spirit, the living waters that Christ spoke of, and that's what um, the prophecy is about. That's interesting. And, you, know, you know, when I wrote the book um, years ago, uh, I made many prophecies about these days and what's coming, and most of it's unfolding right now. Um, I made many prophecies about the economics and them that are born in this generation are going to be brought to want, which is happening as you see it around you right now. Uh, all around the world, the economy is collapsing. I said that the currencies would collapse around the world, and they are. Um, you know, and I've been, with some of these predictions, I remember my wife, who I've been married to 22 years, 
uh, who's from Moscow, and she used to say, oh, Ron, I, can't, I just don't believe that thing about, you know, the, America it can't be. You know, America is a great country, and I don't see how it could, um, you know, be brought to its knees economically. And um, unfortunately, um, I, I'm getting to a point where she's beginning to see it and uh, and see the reality of it. And, but, you know, there's so much here. I, I don't want to get long-winded on it, but, uh, I mean, I'm very – evangelical about it. I think that uh, the people have a right to know the truth. Um, I know that, um, I do know that when I wrote my book, uh, I had, even when I talked about in the, in the last days, when we talked about knowledge shall be increased in those days, who would have known, who would have known the instant access to knowledge that everyone has today? I mean, if you look at this as Aquarius as I know is the key word. We've been in, I believe, for the last 2,000 years, which is the sign of Pisces, the belief age. And so we've had believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All things are possible in the name of the belief. You know, belief, belief, belief. It's all been for the last 2,000 years. Water baptism, which is Pisces, a water sign. Fish Friday, the sign of the fish, Pisces. Uh, um, the um, uh, 12 disciples, the 12 sign Pisces, the... Uh, uh, fishers of men, which the disciples were called, that's all Piscean. Uh, uh, anyway, we could get into all that. But there, the thing is, Aquarius, who would have ever thought, even when I was writing my book in the 70s, uh, uh, who would have thought that when it said knowledge shall be increased in those days, that anyone can get on a computer today, and even on their little smartphone, and access any kind of information instantly, within a millisecond almost. They can find any kind of information about anything there is. They can find knowledge on any subject that exists. And uh, who would have known that could happen in this day and age? I mean, it's amazing when you think about it, that that involvement of the access to knowledge has come so far in just a few a uh, couple of uh, decades, really. Right. And, uh, what, you know, and we're heading for even better things. So in terms of that, the problem with knowledge is, uh, it's not always combined with wisdom. There's a, you know, knowledge is proud. It knows so much. Uh, wisdom is humble. It knows so little. And knowledge can be a hurtful thing as well as a good thing. So let's, let's hope that's that true. To good use. That's exactly the key too, is the use of it. Well, listen, my wife is one of the people in the chat room wanting to know if you're going to be doing any readings because she wants one. And also, in addition to that, I was wanting to bring up to you because what you said about the uh, water bearer a minute ago is that I'm familiar with some work by, I think her name was Akira Smith and also uh, Malik Jabbar and a few others. That there was an old, old writer that is also, uh, I want to say his name was Kelsey or something, that has done work on the... Uh, Birth of Christ and its uh, astrological symbology uh, that was really meant. And the thing always ends up at the end with Jesus telling the disciples to follow the uh, water bearer into the house. And that usually what he's referring to is following the uh, prophet or the avatar of this season, this age, into the Holy Spirit. I, I love that interpretation, and I'm, I'm, I think it's very accurate. Um, I I really never saw that connection before, so you brought to me something that I hadn't put together before. I think that's that's quite accurate. Um, you know, so there's so much here. Uh, I mean, there's no end to the analogies and the mysteries that are hidden there. You know, it says Christ spoke to the multitudes in parables, but to his disciples only did he share the mysteries of heaven. And that's one of the things my book deals with is the mysteries of heaven and uh, the profound, profound, really, the profound mysteries that have kept a lot of people in darkness, uh, you know, that haven't been revealed, have been repressed by the church. And um, so, yeah, I, uh, there's such a, it's such a, a wealth of information on this subject and I, I would love to see it all collectivized and brought together in, uh, in a more cohesive way. I think my book has done that in a big way. Um, so anyway, um, I want to say one more thing about the book. Um, uh, the book has really had high review from scholars. Um, one of the top scholars in the world said it should be compulsory reading for everybody and for every thinking individual is what he said. And, um, I, I say that to say I'm not a scholar, but to have that kind of review from one of the top scholars in the world is really 
uh, was a blessing. I remember he met me. He called me up. He said, I've never called an author in 17 years, he said. And uh, he said, this book is, uh, is just phenomenal, he said. And he said, I would like to proof it for you to protect it from any attack for any type of, um, uh, you know, mistakes or things that he thought shouldn't be in there. But he did. He spent hours reviewing the book, and he sent the copy to me, all the reviews. And we had arguments about Morton Subic, which I held my guns to. I wouldn't change it. And uh, it, ten years later, he acknowledged that I was right on that subject, and I'm glad I never changed it. But anyway, enough of all that. So what I guess I'm trying to say is that um, the book is maybe, I believe, and it's, I hope that's not sounding egotistical, but it may be one of the most profound revelations given to this mankind, really, in this day and age. And um, even Dr. Mackay, Adam Mackay, said uh, that we should reinterpret the Bible in the time and the date and the place and the time that we live. Uh, in the most advanced consciousness of the possible people that are living today. And uh, so, anyway, enough of that. Um, as far okay. as charts, I didn't, I didn't know uh, we were going to do that, but I could do it. Um, I have no, no qualms of doing that at all. If you want to give me a um, chart of name, date, and place of birth and time, um, I can put that into the computer and I could do readings. There's no problem with that. Well, I'm hoping that she's listening to you and can give the time of birth because I don't know the time, but at least I'm lucky enough to know the uh, date because if I didn't know that, I'd be in divorce court. But <clears throat> it's um, her name's Carol Holloman. She was born December 11th. Wait, wait, wait. wait. One minute, one minute. Let me get it. I'm going to have to put the phone down off my ear and put it on the uh, speakerphone. Okay. And we'll see if we can. We'll see if we can manage this. Hang on a minute. All right. Okay, it's Carol. Oh, I got Carol. I'll just put Carol. And what is, um, hang on a minute. Let me, um, and what city is she born? Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. And, uh, her date of birth is 12 11 66. Um, 12 11 66. Okay. Okay, and what time was she born? Well, I'm still waiting for her to put that in the chat room. Maybe she put it into Skype for me and I didn't see her. Well, no, she didn't do that either. Okay. I'm wondering if she heard what, uh, she was, she, uh, okay, she says it was 1.35 p.m. Oh, you got time at 1.35? Yeah, she just now put it in the chat room. She must have been distracted. Okay, 1.35 p.m. And, um... Let me let me do this real quick. Okay. Okay. All right, I have her chart up. She has her moon and sun in Sagittarius in the ninth house. Uh, very strong emphasis on religion, philosophy, and higher understanding. Uh, ninth house is the house of those things, and Sagittarius is its natural ruler. Uh, so her soul and her spirit are, are really gravitating towards understanding uh, consciousness of God and uh, unity with all things. Uh, she also has Venus with her son, which means a very loving person, very uh, very loving spirit. Venus in conjunction with the son is just that. Uh, and it's also, because it's joined with the sun, it's also joined with the moon, because the moon and sun are together. So that gives a, a beautiful soul. Venus is beauty and the moon is soul. Um, she has, uh, <clears throat> let me look at that. Thank you, Pisces. She has a opposition between, uh, Saturn and Pluto and Uranus in her chart. Um, and that's squaring her Venus. Uh, it's a peak cross, actually, uh, formed between Pluto, Uranus, uh, Sun, <coughs> and, um, and, uh, Sun, Venus. Moon. So it's a peak cross involving all those planets. There's two, three, four, five, six planets involved in the peak cross. Uh, I would say from these, this, these positions, she's been divorced. She went through a lot of pain in relationships, a lot of disappointments. Um, she is, um, uh, forgive me for the expression, but Saturn in the 12th house says she's experienced being backstabbed, uh, 
literally, physically, not physically, but figuratively, probably not physically, but she's had some very hard knocks in life uh, in regard to relationships. But probably the most the most significant thing in the chart is the cross that's involved with these planets. Um, she has Jupiter and Leo. Um, Jupiter and Leo in the fifth house. Uh, she may be blessed with a child, the first child. It looks like the first child would be uh, indicated by that. Uh, very powerfully uh, blessed, um, something to do with the first child, I feel. So I don't know that we're getting feedback from her, but uh, I'd like to kind of hear back. It's hard when I'm doing a chart and I can't talk with someone. Right. Uh, I'd like to get some feedback as to how right this is in terms of where we're at now. Uh, well, I can tell you that... Uh some of that's pretty doggone right. I mean, she has had a lot of pain in relationships, uh, you know, et cetera. Uh, she never has been divorced. Me and her have been married steady for, it'll be 25 years this uh, September. But she did almost leave me at one point. Uh, you could be picking up a reading off of that close proximity. Well, you know, um, one thing, I didn't know this was your wife. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you did tell me that, but I didn't know that. Okay. Um, I, I, I would have walked a little more gingerly here, I think, if I'd have known that. But there's definitely there's definitely been some hardships uh, between you and her and some hard knocks. That um, I feel like um, um, one of the issues that I feel with her chart, Saturn's in the rising in the east and right above the horizon when she's born. And um, she um, has, had some real issues with her father. And uh, I think that that has caused a lot of um, um, sense of um, insecurity in her. Can I say that? Uh, right. Now, I thought I'd let you know she just put in the chat room she can call in. So uh, I may interrupt you in just a second to answer her call because if I don't get to it quick enough when it does ring, it may want to try to go to um, call notes. But uh, okay. go ahead with right. where you're at while we're waiting for her to call. All right. Um, so basically, um, this is a mutable, mutable seat cross, and uh, anybody that has one, I have a, I have a mutable cross in my chart, and uh, the mutable crosses um, are not like fixed. The fixed crosses um, usually, very often, a mutable cross will marry somebody that's got a fixed cross or somebody that's got a fixed emphasis in their chart, because the fixed charts are very steady and solid. They just don't change. They, they hang in. Uh, no matter what, whereas the mutable charts, the mutable uh, signs want to run away. Uh, so when, hi there. Uh, I'm sorry. She called, and I just went ahead and picked it up. I thought if I waited to respond to her, she'd wait till you were through speaking, but she didn't. Dave, you're going to have to mute your deal back there. It's creating an echo. Hold on. Let me tell speaker. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Is, is Carol there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. I can hear you well now. Okay. So anyway, um, so I was—I don't know—you've heard everything I've said so far. Yes, sir. Uh huh. So essentially, the the chart is what's called the T cross, and it shows um, uh, when he, anybody has Saturn on a, a T cross, as you do, um, it shows it. One of the one of the things that you've had to deal with in your life a lot with is your own self image. Yes, very true. You, do you understand what I mean? Exactly, that's exactly true. So there tends to be very low self esteem in somebody with this cross. Yeah, um, and, and so you've you've been dealing with that a lot in your life, I think, um, and a lot of it came from being accused a lot when you were younger, and being constantly fine people finding fault with you and your family? That's, that's right on the money. So one of the reasons that uh, what Saturn is is where we got our, the Christians got their word Satan from. And Saturn Saturn is called the accuser of our brother. And he who accused our brother before God both day and night. So whenever I see Saturn afflicting like it is in this chart, it means that your life has suffered a lot, both your soul and your spirit. Uh, because of being accused a lot um, and judged a lot, uh, and um, you know, you never, you never could be good enough uh, for your family members. And yeah. 
Oh, no, I was just, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. So, the, the interesting thing about this chart, though, is that you, you're such a magnificent spirit and soul. You have Venus joined with the sun and moon in your ninth house. And, uh, you know, you're truly a speaker of truth. And, uh, you know, your life is dedicated to that. Not only is, uh, is your son, um, um, you know, your, your son in Sagittarius, your moon in Sagittarius and Venus in Sagittarius, but your Jupiter's in Leo as well. And Jupiter is, um, uh, the spirit of truth and light and understanding. It's wisdom. So you really, you really have a lot of wisdom to give. You would be great with children, especially, uh, um, not preschool so much, but, um, children who are, um, more like, uh, middle school, that type of area. Um, oh. where, go, go ahead. No, I was just saying, huh? That's interesting. So the reason is that Jupiter, Jupiter's in your fifth house, and the fifth house was children. And, uh, it means you can bring a lot of light and wisdom to children and to, uh, help them develop a sense of their own worth and their own value. Uh, Jupiter's in Leo, which means that when it comes to, uh, spiritual things, you're very queenly. Uh, you have an ability uh really uh to exercise strong virtue when it comes to uh loyalty um faithfulness and and uh and particularly uh taking care again back to children there's anything to do with children i also think with jupiter and leo um that you shine the best uh when you're performing and I don't know what that means. Have you been, ever been uh, allowed or given any uh, training in any kind of, uh, like, piano or no, anything I to do did, with I know a few songs on the piano, but that's about it. Um, I did drama in high school, but um, I didn't really do any plays or anything like that because I was too shy in high school. But I had a little bit of training like that. Yeah, you know, you have that's a contradiction because I told you that. Uh, you know, the problem with self-image, Saturn on that cause, which is constant shyness. That's on the ascendant rising in the east when you were born. So that gives us a constant feeling of non-worth. So you have Jupiter and Leo. You have Jupiter and Leo. And that means that if you were performing or doing something where you were entertaining others, you would be at your best at that light. That's when you shine the most. Because Jupiter's in the sign of entertainment. Uh, recreation, amusement, entertainment. It's in the house and in the sign of Leo. So, you know, whatever is involved, your life gets involved on that level, it'd be good. Now, one thing uh, I need to tell you, Carol, I haven't, um, I haven't got the time or the wherewithal to do all the work on this chart, whether it's the progressions and the transits and, you know, the, the type of work that I'm going to do to give you a look at where you're at in your life right now and what's going on and what's coming. Uh, also, get the basic roots of the chart, the natal chart, and give you my information. And I hope this has been insightful on some level for you. It has. It really has. Thank you very much. Oh, you're sure welcome, and thank you for uh, volunteering. You're welcome. Bye, honey. All right. Bye, dear. Bye. Bye. Well, okay, I hate to have spring this on you, uh, Ron, but while he, had, while uh, genocide was in the chat room, or James is his real name, Heard you uh, given that? He said, I want one. <laughs> okay. So, what does, let me get set up to do this. Okay. Um, if you want to talk while I do this, well, I need to get information from you. So, let me just start with it uh, and do a new chart here real quick. Okay. So, his name is James, and what is his, uh, where was he born? Uh, Moreland, Oklahoma. M O O R E. L A N D, Oklahoma. Okay, and what is his birthday? Eleven four eighty one. Wait, I've got a I've got a little challenge here. Hang on a minute. Okay. I've got to find Moreland. Let's see if it's in here. Oh, I found it. Okay. It's got an E after that R, that's why I didn't find it by the way. Oh, okay. I okay. thought I mentioned it. If I didn't, I apologize. Yeah, you did. I just had typed M O O R instead of anyway, what is the birthday? Um, eleven four eighty one. Eleven four. Eighty one. Okay. And um, 
I think the other part you need is the uh, time of uh, birth, 8.45 a.m. What time? 8.45 a.m. Okay, 8.45. A.m. All right. Okay, um, let's see what we have here. Okay, I got the chart up. Um, he's got Sagittarius rising, one degree Sagittarius. He's got his moon in, um, in Scorpio, I mean, his sun in Scorpio, excuse me, at 12 degrees in the 12th house. And he's got the most elevated and powerful planets in his chart are Saturn and Mars. Mars is just a midheaven when he's born. Um, you often find these charts with these elevations and this kind of uh, preponderance of uh, of energies from Mars and Saturn uh, with people that have had some military experience. Now, is uh, James, uh, is he there? Uh, yes, he just asked if I wanted him to call in, and I was just telling him he could, but he might want to wait for me to speak to him before he uh, spoke up. Because <laughs> okay. I thought you might be asking him. Yeah, he's right there in the chat room. Who he is now? Oh, right. no, we almost hit the wrong thing. I started to hit answer. There we go. I had the group call. Okay, James, you're on live. Yes, sir. I was curious. Hi, James. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, James. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, thanks for doing this for me. Yeah. Um, were you in the military? No. Okay. Are you involved in any kind of martial arts or anything? Uh, I used to box. Used to box? Yeah, I used to box. Professionally or just semi? Just amateur. Okay. That's what I expected because you've got Mars as the most elevated planet in your chart. It's just a midheaven. So it shows a, uh, you know, strong pugilistic or martial arts or military influence. Um, you could have done well in the military probably, although, um, uh, you've got the uh, Korean moon, so you tend to love your freedom too much. Um, but you have Saturn and Libra. Um, and it's really a constellium of planets. Do you know astrology a little bit? Not really, no. Okay. So you have Saturn, Mercury, Pluto, and Jupiter all together in Libra in your chart. Very powerful constellium. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, really, really shows an emphasis on, um, uh, unions, marriage, and, you know, uh, putting your energy the life efforts into someone else's life. Are you married? No. Okay. <laughs> now, you're born, and let me get your, you're born in 81. Right. So, you've never been married at all? No, sir. All right. Um, I'm, I'm a little surprised with this strong Libra influence, because there's four planets in Libra, all in 11 towers. Uh, normally, normally it shows a strong indication of somebody that's got a partner or a relationship. Are you involved in a business partnership? Uh, no, not, no. Not even that, huh? No. I can't, I certainly can't describe that at all. But anyway, yeah. this, the other, the other side of this chart is that, um, you have, uh, you have your, uh, your planet, uh, 12 degrees Scorpio squaring your moon. Uh, that means there's a great amount of conflict between the soul and the spirit. The moon is the soul and the subconscious, and the sun is the spirit. And these are at war in this chart, which means that there, there's a great amount of conflict. Also, Mars is afflicting uh, your moon as well. It's afflicting it by what we call a twin trunk aspect. So this shows that um, when we see this kind of an aspect, it means there's a great, great conflict between will, which is the sun, and the moon, which is your your uh, feelings and your emotions. So it's sort of like somebody that has sometimes challenges when it comes to uh, quitting a habit because moon in regard, moon represents your habits, your emotional needs. The sun represents your willpower. And these are at war. And so there's generally a lot of battle in your own self trying to overcome habit patterns that maybe not something you want to have in your life. Yeah, uh, it might. I have a hard time. I'm, I've been trying to quit smoking, but <laughs> it just hasn't happened. Yeah, I, I kind of figured you did smoke, and that's one of the things that this act indicates is that 
a great war with, uh, you've got to be careful about anything that's addictive. Cigarettes or drugs. Or sex, quite frankly. All these areas, uh, you know, can draw you into uh, a great amount of struggle between your soul and your emotions and your will and your feelings. And there's constant battle in your spirit all the time between these. Uh, I also think that when you have Venus conjunct Neptune, and uh, uh, that generally represents somebody that's had some secret love affairs or relationships that maybe were outside the limits of what would be considered okay. Um, that did happen, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I said that, that did happen, secret love affairs, yeah. Okay. And uh, that's because Venus is with Neptune. And Neptune is things that are uh, kind of behind the scenes, and you can't bring them up to the surface for others to see. And um, anyway, you also have Venus in Sagittarius, which means you're a loving, kind of a loving spirit, but you're also free loving. You kind of have an attitude towards uh, relationships that you you really want to have freedom. And that may be why that uh, emphasis of all these planets and Libra is predominating. Because Venus is in Sagittarius, which is a free-loving spirit, and uh, not, not wanting to be tied down by relationship. Yeah. So I have a feeling that's what uh, what that's about. Um, but we also, uh, so so far it sounds like you're telling me that I'm in constant conflict with myself. You know, I think there is a lot of conflict in you, and I think that there's a lot of warring going on in your uh, in between the will and the feelings, the will and the emotions. Uh, you think that you have to fight laziness a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah just, just dead would, on. Somebody say, would somebody say that about you if they knew you? Huh? Do what? I'd say, would that fit you if someone was just talking to you or knew you? Would they see that in you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, the other, the other side, you hit that dead on. That, that's good. You hit that dead on. Okay. Um, the reason is because the moon is a child. It wants to be cared, nurtured, breastfed, if you would. <laughs> it come. Uh, and yet, the sun with, with power is warring with that. So it shows that this conflict is kind of ingrained in your soul. And uh, the other side of this chart is uh, this Mars in the midheaven. Um, um, and then you have the Scorpio, Scorpio Sun, which is very strongly influenced by, of course, uh, uh, Mars and Scorpio are very related. So there's a very high sexual drive in you, a very strong sexual drive. The, the interesting thing is you probably uh, would do well to look at Tantric Yoga, um, understanding and learning how to utilize that energy, the Kundalini forces. Uh, I think that this would be a good direction for you to go in your life and get some, maybe some stabilization of that uh, drive and some direction for it that would give you a little bit better channel for it, if I can say that, okay? Okay. Um, okay, so do you, have you ever considered doing yoga? Uh, I thought about it, but I just never tried it. Yeah, I would really highly recommend it for you. Because you, one of the things, anybody has Mars in the midheaven, um, and it's afflicting the moon. It means that if you if you don't get enough activity, uh, enough energy ex expressed in doing something that's actively physical, you become very irritable and very hard to live with. Yeah, I, I, um, that's true too. That's gross so, about that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, me and Royce have known each other for quite a while. Okay, so you guys know each other. So you need to be, you need to be, uh, you know, there's a, if you, I'm going to hit you a little bit hard here, but there's a, there's a bit of a bit, I'm, I'm going to hit you hard, okay? I'm going to okay. hit you hard. There's a bit of immaturity about anger. You're dealing with things with anger sometimes is very immature. Um, and the reason I say that is because don't get angry at me now. <laughs> I'm not. Sorry about it. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you. But the reason I'm saying that is because um, uh, Mars and the Moon are afflicted. The Moon is the child in you, and Mars Mars being afflicting to the Moon means you you were hurt a lot as a child. Yeah. And that 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 childhood pain gets surfaced real easy if someone pushes the wrong buttons with you. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that makes that makes absolute total sense. Okay, 
So my, my advice to you is a couple of things. One is go back to boxing or yoga or go back to something that's very physical. Spend a little bit of time in the gym if you need to. Get away from the computer all day. You know, you have a great aptitude for computer things. Yeah. Okay. I anything anything to do with, well, you have moon and Aquarius for one, which is the new age uh, energies, and uh, your soul is kind of identified with this new age stuff. Your anything to do with uh, technology, innovation, invention, you know, that's where your skill is. Yeah. So I'm a computer and network tech. So. Okay. Well, that's well, good. That, you hit that dead on too. Well, you know, you're, you're a beautiful chart, and you really do, and uh, I don't, uh, you've got Uranus, another reason why you're so tied up with the computer stuff is Uranus is rising in the east when you were born, it's right on the ascendant, which tells me you have a high degree of genius, uh, and intellectual genius, but more than that, you have a r original uh, outlook on life and ability to see things outside the boxes, they say. You're real good at that. You're very good at innovation, in innovation and uh uh, inventions, really invention. You could almost work in that direction if you wanted to. Okay, my friend. Well, I hope it's been useful for you, James. Yes, thank you very much. You, you, you was right about so many things. It's weird. I, I've always kind of thought that that there was something to astrology, but uh, but I've I've never had my chart read by by a professional. And you nailed a lot of things perfect, dead on. So well, it makes, thank you it for makes that. me believe it. It makes me believe in it that much more. Well, I appreciate your your, your comments. Uh, one of the things is this is not a full reading. It's a uh, you know I, I'm going to very quickly pulling a chart up. I'm not really seeing your progressions, your transits. There's a lot of influences that I can't see. Um, I could probably you know predict things much more accurately if I had the time to do a complete workup on you, but that's not going to happen on this show right here. Oh, I understand. How much would you charge for something like that? Um, I charge two forty nine. And I can do it on the phone. Uh, I take credit cards, any kind of credit card. Um, and um, it's a good hour's reading. Uh, and uh, I record it for you so you have it for posterity, if you would. And, um, you know, it's uh, you can set it up an appointment with me. I'm booked usually for at least one or two weeks ahead most of the time. But just call and set up an appointment with me. My number, I'll give you, it's my toll-free number is 1-800-38. I'll oh, check it. Hang on. Okay, shoot. Okay, it's 1-800-382-4667. Okay, I got I got 1-800-382-4667. You got me, guy. Okay, All thank right, you James. very much. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Hi, Bye. Royce. Okay, Bye. thanks for calling in, James. Now, <laughs> Les just chimed in. Now, he said if you... Uh, was uh wanted to do him he would appreciate it but if not he wouldn't uh you know be uh, upset or anything but he said he does not want to call in uh you know during the reading so do you want to go ahead and go with him or what do you want to do you know i really um the problem with that is you know that i really because i i, I get real personal with people and i really do sometimes We'll push the person's button, and I don't want to do that if I'm not getting feedback because I I know when to pull back when I need to by listening to the other person. Right. Uh, when I say that, I just because it's it's like uh, I can read blind. I don't need a, a person to be there, but I just would rather have them there when when I'm doing a reading. So yeah, I think that you know if he wants to set up an appointment with me some other time, he, he's got my 800 number. I'm sure he can call and we can uh, arrange an, uh, a reading. But. Uh, and so far as doing it without having at least some feedback, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's advisable, really. Okay. Well, that's definitely understandable. And, you know, so far you've been getting uh, rave reviews from everybody that you have done, so that's worked out pretty good. Now, my wife was asking if that was uh, $2.49 uh, or 249 I think that would be $249. Yeah, 249 uh, Yeah, that's 249 for the reading. It's... 249, and uh, it's a complete reading. You'll, you'll also receive uh, thorough reports uh, that will be involved in that as well as the reading itself. So the reading is the most critical part, and that's because it takes an astrologer to integrate everything. What you can get off a generated computer report is not going to be anywhere near what you get from an astrologer. So, so it's a lot more in-depth than most people realize. 
Well, you know, you really see the soul and the spirit of a person, and you really see where their pain and suffering is, if they have it. You can tell generally even physical problems. Uh, the mutable signs, when you have a mutable cross, um, uh, which uh, I have, uh, your your wife has, for example, uh, the mutable crosses are mental suffering more than they are physical suffering. The cardinal crosses tend to be uh, uh, physical, very often physical suffering. Um, and the the six crosses, which are, uh, I should name what these crosses involve, the six crosses are uh, Taurus, Leo, uh, Scorpio and uh, Aquarius, that's called the six, those signs are fixed signs. So you have an emphasis of planets in those signs and you have configurations of planets that are star-crossed from each other, then you can have problems that involve um, really not, not knowing when to let go, uh, holding on long past the time you should have released something. Uh, very stubborn sign can cause problems through stubbornness. Um, and they also can be physical in, in the way they happen. The interesting thing about Saturn energy, Saturn afflictions uh, produce bone and teeth problems. Uh, for example, arthritic problems very often. Um, uh, you know, you, people that have that, also people that have Saturn crosses are, generally have problems with weight. Now, uh, forgive me for getting personal, but you, you put her up here, your wife has that problem. Right. Well. She's dealing with weight problems, and she has a hard time losing it. So the reason I know that is because Saturn's on the cross with this chart. Okay. So uh, you know, I don't don't mean to get too personal, but I I need to tell you what I'm seeing. And they give me a chart, I'm going to speak what I see. You know. But the other side of it is um, Jupiter is your vision of the future. Jupiter's optimism. The ancient name for Jupiter was Optimum Maximus. Huh. And that's the same name used in Transformers. Say that over? That's the same name used for one of the uh, Transformers in the movie. You have to wonder if that's where they got it from. Uh, I didn't know that, really. Yeah, the, the interesting thing with Jupiter is, uh, you know, uh, Jupiter is your sense of faith and optimism. Jupiter is your faith. And Jesus is, is Jupiter. The archetype for Jesus was Jesus, 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 okay? That's where it came from. Saturn was where we got our Satan from. Satan, Saturn, the, 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 the devil, all that, you know? He's called the accuser of our brother, and he who accused our brother before God both day and night. The interesting thing was uh, anybody's got Saturn on a cross, like your wife does, uh, she's always dealing and has to deal with guilt, and she needs to let go of that. She needs to be, you know, forgive herself and forgive others. Because anybody that's got Saturn on a cross can be very, sometimes holding on to grudges and, and resentments towards people that have hurt her. Uh, and for things that maybe you've done in the past, for example, uh, that she finds hard to let go of. Um, this is hard because you should never throw your wife's chart out here first. I didn't know it was her. But anyway, so. But that's okay so like because she's still in there chatting, so I, I guess she's not upset. <laughs> okay. So anybody. Anybody who has Saturn on a chart uh, in an affliction uh, has to deal with um, uh, guilt. You know, if you look at if you look at um, the early early Christian introduction of the whole process of the fall of Adam and Eve, there's a real profound mystery hidden in that. Uh, uh, you know, it says they were in a place called paradise. The root of the paradise comes from two roots. Para means beyond, like parapsychology, and dice means to divide. So they were in a place that was beyond division, called paradise, Adam and Eve were. And uh, they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. And who, who beguiled them or tempted them to do that? But the devil. The devil comes from the, word, the root word diabolos. Right. Which is, okay, which it has two meanings. Uh, it's di divide and abolos abolish, divide and destroy. The old military strategy, divide and destroy. Um, the etymologist uh, uh, will say it comes from two roots, D-I-A, which is diameter, and bolos, which is to hurl across, ballistic, like bolos. So that it has, it basically, that's the etymological interpretation of the word. But I give it a two meanings, and the other one is divide, abolish, divide and abolish, divide and destroy. So who introduces into this concept of duality to Adam and Eve, but Diablo, divide and destroy so what happens is 
when they are confronted by God, the first process that happens is is that Adam says, it's not my... Oh, first they beheld their nakedness and they were shamed. So shame implies something going on within their consciousness, and that is the, the shame is guilt. It's self-directed guilt. So they, they're all of a sudden now they're walking in guilt. So when, when, when God approaches them, Adam says to God, he says, well, it's not my fault. It's the woman now gave it to me. So it's your fault and it's hers that this happened. So we begin to see the process of called the scapegoating, finding someone else to blame. Scapegoating comes from the goat sign Capricorn, which is Saturn sign or Satan. So the next thing that happens is Eve's not going to take the blame. So what does she say? Well, it's not my fault. The woman, he said, the serpent beguiled me. So we see the beginning of the fall of man. Now, there was no Adam, there was no apple tree, as people believe. Uh, Adam's apple is right here in your throat. It's, it's a part of your vocal system that you, allows you to speak. And it was the Adam's apple, the misuse of the word, that caused the fall of man. So, anyway. That was an interesting concept that I'd never made the connection before between Adam's apple and the uh, forbidden fruit. Well, I always think about it rather than as an apple as forbidden fruit, and that might be why I never, you know, made the con uh, the connection before. Um, well, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. just going to, you know, well, I was just going to ask you, though, as a toying with the idea, you really raised my curiosity and got me interested because you were doing so good with James and my wife, and I did put her out there in fairness. I was thinking I should put myself out there, but I don't want to put you out of your way. Would it be too much trouble for you to do one for me? No, I don't mind doing that. No, no. Um, let me get, get the information here. Hang on. Let me put the phone down. Okay. All right, Roy. What is your uh, birthplace? Houston, Texas. Okay. And what is your birth um, birth time or date? Okay, the birth date is August twelfth, nineteen fifty nine. And if hang I remember, on, hang, hang on a minute. August twelfth. I'm not as fast as I should be when I'm trying to do both of these things here. What year, 19 what? Uh, 1959. Okay. And uh, what time were you born? 1.33 a.m. 1.33 a.m. Okay. All right, I got your chart up. Um, you're a Leo, obviously. And... Um, you have your sun conjunct Uranus and Mercury in the third house of communication in Leo, which means you're a natural performer in, uh, in communication. That's the perfect place for those planets. Um, first of all, Mercury is in its own house, the third house. It's joined with Uranus, which is New Age, everything to do with the New Age. And what are you basically? You're a communicator of New Age things. And you've got the sun right there with all those planets, with those two planets. You've got the sun joined with Uranus. I mean, basically, you're a new age spirit. That's your whole role in life. But more importantly, you're you're here to facilitate the communication. Of well, this is exactly what I'm doing. Oh, it's perfect. Your chart speaks so perfectly about that. Um, you have uh, you have Pluto, Mars, and the uh, Pluto, Mars, and Venus joined together in, in a conjunction. Well, I say Mars and Venus are Mars and Venus are in Virgo in your fourth house. I, one thing about Mars-Venus conjunctions, it's kind of hard to, uh, a difficult sign conjunction to have because it, it's called a love-hate complex. And that means that in relationships, you, you can be very difficult to live with because you tend to be, you tend to be very affectionate at times. And then at other times, once your affections have been fulfilled, uh, you tend to be very irritable. Um, I hope that's not, uh, too personal. Oh, no, that's fine. So and I did get very irritable because I'm something of a perfectionist. <laughs> but go ahead. Yeah. So what it is is a, what they call a love-hate complex. It's one that's very difficult because uh, you've got both energies, of Mars, which is uh, kind of aggression, very sexual, and you have Venus there, which is a, affection. The other side of that is very often 
it's hard to distinguish for the meat sometimes the difference between, um, you know, affection and sex. In other words, you're, you're, you tend to mix the two up very easy, and that can be hard on the woman uh, because she'll see it as maybe, you know, you, you, you think you're being affectionate because that's how you can satisfy your affection. But Mars means, I'm, you know, I need you physically. And these are combined together in your chart. So, And it's also with Pluto. Pluto's real close to those. So it's a very sexual energy. Um, the other side of this, you have your moon in Scorpio conjunct with Jupiter. Um, and I haven't even touched Saturn yet. Saturn's in your chart. It's in uh, zero Capricorn. It's the end of Sagittarius. And uh, that also, uh, well, let's, let's leave that one till next. we got Jupiter conjunct the moon. That's... Uh, uh, um, the moon and sun in your chart are doing the same thing I just talked to the other gentleman about. They're squaring each other. And if you remember, I talked about conflict between will and emotions and between will and habits. Right. Um, you also would be battling weight and is a major problem. Uh, moon, moons in Scorpio conjunct Jupiter, and that means that your, 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 your comfort needs are very big. Jupiter's magnanimous. It's big. And so, you know, you love your comforts. You love your, uh, you love the being nurtured and taken care of. Um, and this is in Scorpio again. So we're back to a lot of it's sexual. You have very strong sexual energies. Um, the other side of that is that Saturn in your chart is in zero degrees of Capricorn. It's in its own sign, which means that you have very good, uh, business sense, a very good sense of business and what, uh, what can work. Uh, Capricorn sign is I use, and Saturn is the planet of structure. So you're very good to use the structures that are around you to create a business opportunity. Um, you probably have, uh, if, if I was looking for somebody to, go, to join into a business, I would look for you. Because you have that capacity to build a foundation and bring the right people together to get, because you're good at using, excuse me, and I don't mean this negatively because it's not meant that way. But you're good at using other people's talents and putting them to work for yourself. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Any good manager or any good boss is going to be, you know, thrilled to have that kind of a, uh, aptitude. So the other side of that, Saturn, and there's another reason why you're good at this. The business sense is strong, so strong. Because Saturn is trying to Pluto, um, and it tends to bring in the Saturn trying to uh, Mars and Venus, even though it's a long orb. But because Pluto is so close to those planets, it tends to make for a strong trine energy, which is very positive energy. Um, uh, I see it that there's something involving uh, – was there a death in your home in early life? Uh, when I was 11, my grandmother died, and I was the one that found her out in the uh, garden. That's what I'm seeing. Um, that's had a big impact on you. Because Mars, you know, see, Mars is in Pluto are, are sitting in your fourth house. They're together. And the fourth house is early childhood. And that's your home. And Pluto's death. And Mars means you you took a great blow from that, your psyche. Um, and that was a, a very difficult thing for you to deal with at that age in your life. And you, you repressed a lot of that, I think. But I'm thinking, I have a feeling that that there's a lot of stuff that you pushed down after that experience uh, that has been something in your inner self that's been a, a bit of a struggle. And it may have led you uh, into some of the things you're into now. Uh, you would tend to have a, a strange energy and interest in uh, anything to do with uh, life and death. Does this mean anything to you? Uh, yeah, I do have a big interest in that, which is also part of the reason why you're on the show, because a lot of what Christ was all about was life and life after death. Exactly, exactly. You know, Pluto in your chart is interesting. Pluto was called by Edgar Casey. He calls it the planet of Christ consciousness. And somehow that early death in your family, in your home, had an impact on that in you. Um, and I don't know whether your grandmother was a religious person. Um, my whole family was a, my dad was a preacher. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm seeing then. Because there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of um, the home light shows a lot of Christ consciousness with Pluto there, um, and an emphasis and kind of a sometimes even a sternness because Mars is joined with that, kind of a sternness about it, uh, a severity sometimes maybe about uh, you know instilling into you the right belief systems. Um, so. But Venus is showing there too, so it's, it's kind of a Venus and Mars are both in the same place. So it, it, you get both the affection, but you get the, the stern taskmaster of Mars. But that's basically um, that's kind of a quick reading. The other the other reason why the death is so important and was so impacting on you, if you have your Moon in Scorpio. I mean, your soul needs to understand death, and it's joined with Jupiter, which tells me that by the way. You're a bit of a prophet about death. Um, you might be able to see people's uh, <laughs> uh, passing ahead of time uh, because Jupiter is the prophet. And it's sitting with the moon, which is your soul, in Scorpio, which is a sign of death, and resurrection as well. We tend to think of Scorpio as death, but it's also the planet or the sign, rather, the house, the sign that represents uh, the resurrected spirit. So you very much, uh, you have a, you have a gift of prophecy, by the way. Uh, Jupiter with the moon. You should be the one interviewed sometimes on these shows. I have a feeling you could blow people away sometimes. Uh, well, the fascinating thing here about what you were saying is like when my aunt's, uh, my wife's aunt passed, uh, she, we were living in the house at the time with her. And, uh, well, right before she died, within the last couple of days, I had told everybody it, that it wouldn't be much longer because it, you look in her eyes, it was like uh, the soul was missing. Wow. And two days later, she did pass away. So, you know, I, hadn't, I didn't think about it at the time. I just thought it was something that most people would notice, in other words. Well, let me tell you why you did see that. You have Jupiter with the moon. The moon is, remember I talked about this earlier, the moon is the soul. The sun is the spirit. Your your moon is in Scorpio, which is the sign of death, which means that you would see the soul of another person very well. And it's joined with Jupiter, which means you're, the Jupiter's Jesus, 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 it's the prophet. Jesus was a prophet. So Jupiter is the prophet, and it sits with your moon, which means you have the ability to feel and to see, Jupiter see, I see, the moon is I feel, death coming. And it's another interesting thing to you is that I want to say to you. Do you remember I told you I saw death in your home? Do you remember I said that? I think so, yeah. Yeah, in the beginning when we talked. Notice that you were in the home of the person again when the, when she died? Right. Kind of like a common thread away. in my life. <laughs> yeah, twice now. Do you see that? Because the moon, you have your fourth house with the home where you live. And you have Pluto with the planet of death sitting right in there joined with Mars, which means that this is two times you've experienced something that most people haven't probably ever experienced, the death of a loved one in your own home that you're living in. You see how accurate this is? Right. Yeah, I can understand. Um, anyway, I think that's all I'm doing with this right now, but I, I, I just uh, I really I just hope that the listeners – get a grasp of how profound a uh, wonderful tool this is. Uh, uh, for very very in-depth tool, I would have to say. Uh, I mean, you're really very impressive in how you do that, and I can imagine you probably had a lot of callers on your radio shows when you used to do them. I, I really did, yeah. We used to light up the phones, and they were lit up all the time. Yeah, so in fact, the matter is, um, um, you know, I... There's many things I, I've seen so much uh, doing readings like that. Or I did them in San Francisco every afternoon for an hour. Um, I used to uh, have shows in San Diego sometimes at night for several hours. And in L.A., we did shows for sometimes two hours at night uh, for uh, for years. But um, we did a lot of seminars, a lot of teaching, a lot of workshops. Uh, I did an extraordinary astrological counseling session so, uh, they they continued for years. Uh, it was a, a, a bit overtaxing at times, in fact. But uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy the, the ability to um, really pierce through beyond the 
surface of things and look at the soul and the spirit and the being a person. I'm, I'm actually listening to the chart talk to me when I look at it, you know? Okay. Well, does your book give any uh, instructions for anybody that might want to do? Uh, that, you know, that want to, uh, to do astrology, that want to, uh, do readings, does it have any instructions in there by any chance? I'm kind of missing that, I think that, let me, let me turn it on the way, hang on, I'm turning it off of, uh, okay. Take it off speakerphone, I'm here, but go ahead. Alrighty. Um, okay, now, um, in your book, was there any kind of like a, a miniature instruction manual of some sort for hopeful astrologers? Um, there's a chapter on this, uh, each of the sun signs. Uh, I initially didn't put that in it, but a professor a friend of mine said, Ron, it's missing that. It should have it so that somebody that doesn't have any familiarity with astrology. Um, the, the chapters in the book um, cover, uh, the first chapter is language of astrology. There's so much we use today, we don't even realize this language that we speak is, is astrological. I mean, the word influenza, the disease influenza, came from that influence of the stars. That's where it came from. Um, consider, the word consider, uh, comes from to be in harmony with the stars. Con, to be together with, and sidereal, sidereal, is the stars. Uh, so um, you look at words like, um, oh, my God, there's so much. Uh, we could do this for hours, the different words that we use that are satirical. came from Saturn. What is satirical humor? It's isn't it poking fun or making, uh, sometimes belittling other people with humor? So what is that again? It's accusing Saturn, satirical, accusing others with humor, satirical humor. It's like uh, pictures of Nixon with a long, swoopy nose, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and Nixon, by the way, is strong Capricorn, uh, and he was the spirit of accusing. He listened to some of his old tapes. People were amazed at this president of the United States, how foul his language was. He was constantly cursing. And he ended up, uh, he was one of the strongest accusers, accusing spirits in the history of this country. And he ended up um, being driven out of office by the very same thing, accusations. But he was very, he was very paranoid. And, um, uh, you know, that's the Saturn consciousness. He also had phlebitis, which uh, could have killed him, which was a blood clot in his knee, in the area of his knees. And Capricorn rules your knees, and blood clotting is caused by Saturn. Saturn is coagula. It causes coagulation and hardening. And Saturn is the... Uh, you know, Saturn is where we got Santa Claus. Did you know that? Uh, no, but I'm not surprised, because Santa and Satan are also uh, phon uh, phonetically linked. Oh, yeah. Did you know that the word Santa... It moved two letters around at Satan. Did you know that? Wait a minute. Do I now Santa what? The word Santa, S-A-N-T-A. It's just a scrambling of the word Satan, S-A-T-A. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, and see, Saturn, Saturn, Satan, or Saturn, Santa Claus was really basically a parody of Santa of Father Time, who is Saturn, who is the Father Time, was called the devourer of all of his children. Okay, the devil is called what? A roaring lion who seeks a whom he might devour. So Santa Claus in the old days was was not a fat, roly-poly guy like he is in the United States. In Europe, he was a skinny, emaciated-looking guy with a long white beard. He only got fat when he got to the United States. <laughs> so what are we dealing with? We're dealing with with Santa Claus. And Santa Claus was a parody of, of Satan or Saturn or Saturn in your chart. Saturn, here's how it works. If the child behaved and was good, what did he get? He got gifts for his birth, for Christmas. But if he was naughty, he got coal in his stocking. Well, Saturn, Saturn in astrology rules rocks, crystals, and minnows. So he's given what? He's given to the children his own symbol, rocks or coal, in their stockings if they've been naughty. And in your chart, it's the same way. Uh, Saturn, everybody's afraid of Saturn in their chart, but Saturn to be the deliverer of good things if you've been good. But it can be also the denier of good if you've been naughty. So anyway, so going back to Santa Claus, Santa Claus was the depiction of uh, Father Time, and he was the representative of um, the, the old man of the sky who was uh, the reaper, if you would. And that's what Saturn was. And if you look at the, uh, there's so much here. Uh, if you look at December 
the birth of the Son, the birth of the uh, Christ. We had celebrated on December 25th. If you draw a chart for any year on December 25th at midnight, when we celebrate Christmas, you'll see that the sun, as it rises in the east, is in the sun. It's, I mean, not rising in the east, at, at midnight, right, when it's uh, Christmas. The rising sign is Virgo, the virgin. So he's born of the Virgo. The sun is born on December 24th. Now he stays three days and three nights, the sun does, in hell, in Capricorn, from the 21st to the 25th, midnight of the 24th. And then on the 25th, he, the sun literally begins to rise again and starts to move back to the northern hemisphere, having spent three days and three nights in hell, which is Capricorn's sign, or Saturn's sign, Capricorn. And um, he's born in the stable. What is that? That's Sagittarius and Capricorn, the horses and the and the goats, which is a sign of those two signs. He's born in that moment. And, uh, oh, there's so much to the story. So, um, you know, every year we celebrate the, the astrological birth of the sun, which is the birth of uh, the son of God, which in the ancient days was understood to be. So. Okay. <laughs> Pardon me. Got a little frog in my throat there. <clears throat> you know, ever since I was a young kid, come this time of night, I start getting hoarse and coughing for some reason. Okay, well, do you want to call it a night for tonight? And uh... Uh, No, I was going to say, um, I just put you on mute real quick so I could cough real quick and, you know, get up that little wad there. But, um, yeah, I was going to say getting back to your book, because one of the things I haven't done yet was tell everybody about your website, www. Uh, dot my gift for you, and that's the number four, uh, dot com. And he's got a blog there, and he keeps it pu- uh, up to date with all the latest things he's got going on. You can also click on the, his book link below his, uh, description there to get the book on Amazon. And you got, I think you also got it linked it, uh, from your site too, don't you? Yeah, you can order it either through our 800 number here, and we can ship it out to you, or you can order it on Amazon, which might be easier. And also Kindle, if you have a Kindle, you can order it on Kindle. Um, it's called uh, The Greatest Story Never Told, and it's by Ron Watson, of course. And uh, I guarantee you, if you read the book from cover to cover, it'll open your eyes to a great amount of truth and knowledge and wisdom. And uh, the important thing with astrology is I, I, it's so important people understand something, you know. Um, the purpose in my mind of what astrology is really about, and I, I don't think it's changed in 2,000 years, the purpose of the astrologers, the Magi, was to find, was to what, lead us to the cradle of Christ. And I really, teach, I believe that, I teach that. I think the purpose of astrology is to lead us to the cradle of divine realization, to, to recognize the God within us and to begin to see who we really are. And, uh, I spend a lot of time in my book, um, uh, there's a chapter in here called The Words. And, uh, how it destroys or creates your life. Most people have no idea. You know, and the early Christians said that the, they described Christ as the Word made flesh. But the problem is you're all the Word made flesh, but you don't recognize that. You don't see the relationship of your words to your life. You know, you, uh, there's a scripture that says, if any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and also able to bridle the whole body. What's offending with the word mean? Okay? I mean, think about that, you know? For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. What's that mean? Because every word you speak, you're judged by. And the problem is you say things, and you put things in your subconscious mind that causes pain and suffering and physical ailments. And when you don't realize the real curses are not damn and hell, the things that you say that are destructive are when you speak with great amount of emotion and feeling, and you get upset or angry at something and you make a statement like, I am sick and tired of you, the subconscious mind has just got that message because the subconscious mind is like pure receptivity. The conscious mind is meant to protect and defend and um, keep the subconscious, the feminine receptive subconscious, from being defiled. But when you get upset, you get emotional, the subconscious relates to emotion, to feeling. So the more feeling you have when you make a statement like, I am sick and tired of you, it's going to put that seed in your own subconscious mind and it's going to create a problem. And the problem is going to be fatigue and illness. Or you get upset and you say, um, you know, things like, uh, uh, it's a killer or it's killing me or, 
Uh, it breaks my heart. You wonder why you have problems. You know, I had a friend I hadn't seen in probably 15 years, and um, a very rich, very successful man in Chicago. And I was sitting in his office one day, and after having not seen him for many years, and he started talking about his ex-wife and how she was alienating his children against him. And then she went on, and he kept talking about him, and he kept saying how it breaks my heart what she's doing. It breaks my heart. I'm, I, you know, I'm, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm just so brokenhearted about this and that. And after about six of those statements, I finally looked at him and I said, John, when was the last time you had your heart checked? And he about fell out of his chair. He said, Ron, how could you know that? He said, I just got out of hospital with pain in my chest and my arm. He said, how would you know that? I said, because you're telling me your heart's broken. And you, you keep saying it over and over and over again. So what you plan in that subconscious mind is going to have its effect, you know? It nauseates me. You want stomach problems, you know? I know a guy that's had two-thirds of his stomach removed, and his favorite expression is, I have no stomach for it. But he doesn't see the relationship between his words and the reality of his physical condition. I know another woman who was dear friend, the doctor's wife, who was a friend of mine and um, knew her for many years uh, uh, in California, and her favorite expression was, I can't stand it. I can't stand this. I can't stand it. She ended up in the hospital with varicose veins so bad she had to, she couldn't walk anymore, couldn't stand anymore. So, you know, you know, I can't bear to see it. I had two students one time. I was giving a lecture and giving a talk. They were students in my class. They were sisters. And um, and they kept, you know, I was talking about this, and I was using some of the expressions that people say. You know, I can't bear to see this. You know, go talk to your mothers, what their favorite expression of their father was. He can barely see today. He's going blind because he, keeps, he used to always say that. He the children would come home, the kids would come home with a problem. He said, I can't bear to see it. Go talk to your mom. And he's barely can see today. Well, I can't bear to hear it. Same thing, hearing problems. Um, you know, uh, we, we can go on and on, you know. I mean, there's so many things that you say. Uh, you get to, so some of them are funny, you know. Uh, get your bottles in an uproar. Right. I set up to hear with him. Um, I remember uh, doing a counseling session with a young lady who kept saying that about her husband. Every time she'd talk about her husband, say, I'm set up to hear with him, and she'd touch her throat. I'm set up to hear with him. And I finally had a, I heard enough of those, and I looked at her and I said, so look, I said, I hate to ask you a very personal question, but I said, when's the last time you had constipation? And she was shocked. She said, I, how did you even know that? She says, I was actually in the hospital. It was so bad. I said, because you're set up to hear with him. So, you know, the word is made flesh. You know, when you say things like he's a pain in the ass, and then you wonder why you have him rights. You know, what you say you're creating into your life, you know. You you know, I know for, I had a guy that used to do a national lecture, a very powerful guy. He was vice president of a company in sales and marketing. And one of his favorite expressions was, it blows my mind. That's what he ended up with, a stroke. So, you know. I could go on and on with it There's so much. I have a whole chapter on the power of the word you speak. And until you understand that, you're going to have problems in your life. You know, um, you know, you grow up with your children and you bring, you bring all these things into their life, not knowing how you're defiling them because the children are pure receptivity and everything you say to them is going into that subconscious mind. I remember my children, when I was growing up, my parents said to me many times, you're going to end up in prison, Ron. Someday you're going to end up in prison. And they were right. You know, how much of that was put in my mind by them? So it's not that which goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but that which cometh out of his mouth, that's what defiles a man. That's scripture. I mean, so you got to learn to understand that if any man of him not in word the same as a perfect man, what's that mean? What's perfection? You know, guard your tongue. You know, if you be a person of few words, but when you do have words to say, make sure that they're positive. You know, there's another thought I want to put out there which people aren't aware of, and that is, you know, the Scripture talks about us, uh, you know, if you're angry with your brother and you curse him, you, you'll be in danger of the judgment. Right. And and anyone that should say to his brother, uh, Raka, which was basically a curse in the old days, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, the fool, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. How, how can that be? Huh? Yeah, that guy was thinking like it was a bit harsh for calling somebody a fool. Jesus said that. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the thing. What it's trying to teach us is this, that when you say something towards another person with anger and hatred or anger, 
That's a strong emotion. Remember, the subconscious responds to what? Emotion or feeling. It's like a good woman. The subconscious is receptive. It doesn't analyze anything. It doesn't rationalize. It takes it just like it is. And it believes it. It's like a good woman. It believes all things, trusts all things. And it's going to take whatever you give it, okay? And it's going to give birth to that in your experience. Because the subconscious is the soul. You know, the soul and the spirit were understood by the early Christians. Mary said, my soul doth my spirit rejoices in God, and my soul doth magnify him. Notice what the soul does. It magnifies. It brings forth something into reality. It gives birth. It fecundates that which the seed has been given to it. And it gives birth to that which we put in it. So so um, where was I at? I was going somewhere on this thought, and I lost my track here a little bit. Well, so you were trying to talk about how um, what you say can actually come back to haunt you because... Your words are creating your reality, whether it be a good reality or a negative reality, uh, because basically your words come back in your own subconscious, and then they become an actual part. Uh, my wife was a good example, and I know I brought her in earlier, and I got away with it, and I'm going to try to get away with it again, because this is a perfect thing. Um, she used to always say, uh, there's a country song out that had my part in it, don't blame her, life made her that way. And then she used to repeat that and repeat that and repeat that, and she ended up with a severe case of depression. Oh, exactly, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, that's, what you just said is what I'm, I'm, I'm basically trying to bring home to the listeners here, and that is that whatever you say, for I'm going to give an example. If I want to wake up tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. feeling wide awake, wide awake, alert, refreshed, I can give my suggestion to myself tonight, which would be this. I could say, I will wake up at 5 a.m. feeling wide awake, alert, and refreshed. I may wake up. I'll wake up at 5 a.m. probably if I do that. But I'll probably go back to sleep if I have no reason to get up at that time. <laughs> the, point I'm getting, the point I'm getting at is that if I said it, instead of saying I will wake up at 5 a.m. feeling wide awake, what if I said to myself, you will wake up at 5 a.m. feeling wide awake, alert, and refreshed? Guess what? The subconscious did not know the difference between I and you. It's like the Jungian collective unconscious. It doesn't understand the difference. So if I say to another person, you son of a bitch, I hope you die, with feeling and emotion, what does my subconscious just got? Hmm. It's, got a, it's got a message towards me, not towards that person. It's hearing it as something I'm saying to myself. So when I curse that other person, I'm cursing myself. You see how that works? Right, because you conscious that and separate who you're talking to. It doesn't see I and you. So if I say you, it's still me. If I say I, it's still me. It's so still my subconscious. You're conscious that and understand the concept of I and you, so therefore everything that you say is automatically yourself. Exactly. So so whatever, I mean, so if that's all you reap, if you're planting those seeds of destruction in your own subconscious mind, that's what you're going to reap in your life. You know, if you sow a thought, you reap an act. If you sow an act, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap a character. If you sow a character, you reap your destiny. But it all starts with what? The thought and the speech. You know, Adam's apple, the cause of the fall of man. Oh, there's so much here. I wish that, you know, I mean, the book cover, that covers the word. There's another chapter in here on the star of the Magi, on the five-pointed star and the mysteries behind it. It was revered by the ancients. It was something that... In fact, Dr. Adam McKay, one of the top scholars in the world, said his only regret in life is he didn't write that chapter. Right. That, well, yeah, because uh, I've seen the um, five-pointed star, David, and some of the uh, depictions that I've seen of it, it was uh, created by the, uh, uh, I might be thinking of a six-pointed star, but the uh, pyramids, uh, one facing up, one facing down, planted inside of each other so that the uh, points all stick out. I'm sure you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, the, the Star David and Solomon Seal are different. Um, okay, so the one I'm thinking of is Solomon Seal. Okay, that's a five-pointed star. And that's the one that the, the wise men were following that they saw in the chart of the child for Christ. And uh, it wasn't a star in its heavens. It was, that's why Herod couldn't find it. It was a star in the chart of a child. So that depiction of that star was always revered in the past. It was a very ancient symbol, and it was considered very protective. The cross, if you wear a cross, you're basically uh, setting yourself up for suffering. 
The cross was a symbol of suffering. The star, the five-pointed star was considered a star of the resurrected Christ. And if you looked at Da Vinci's divine man, that's what that was depicting, the divine man who is who. Okay? Every 2,140 years, there's a new prophet. Each prophet ushers in a new age. If you look at the Tarian age, was the age of the bull of the calf, the golden calf. And that was the age that Moses ended. He said, I'm, he said, no longer worship the golden calf. Now it's about what? The blood of the lamb. Put it on your doorpost and your firstborn will be saved. Because the sign of Taurus was ending, the age of Aries was beginning. And Aries is the sign of the lamb. The lamb of God, the blood of the lamb. So he ushered in, he, you know, he came back down out of the out of the mountains with the Ten Commandments, and what does he see? People got to build another golden calf, because it's a stubborn, tenacious time. He called the people, he called them a stiff-necked people. That's Taurus, stiff-necked people. So he's calling them a stiff-necked people, and he's rebuking them, because they go back to the old method of, of worship. So the next thing we have is the Aries age, and we have the slaughtering of lambs for 2,000 years until Christ comes. Christ was the prophet that ended the Aryan age and brought in the Piscean era. What did Christ say? No longer worship the golden calf. Now, I mean, excuse me. He said, no longer you slaughter any lambs. I'm the last sacrifice to end all sacrifices, he said. So Christ ushered in the Piscean age, made 12 disciples, fishers of men, water baptism. Uh, his name in Greek was Ictus, meant fish. So we get all these symbols. He introduces 2,000 years of belief. Remember when Moses spoke to the burning bush and he was trying to end the Tarian age, what is he told? Did you tell him that I am, that I am sent you, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, is I am that I am. So he was given the key words of the new age, which is Aries, I am. Every age has got a new, a new meaning. Now we're coming into the age of what? I know, the age of knowledge. The time to wake up and know. You know, the word know is amazing. K-N-O-W has within it the word now. And a good student and a poor student is distinguished by only one thing. The good student can be here now. He's not thinking about the past. He's not worrying about the future. He's not daydreaming about another time. He's in the present. And that's where knowledge and all good things come from, right here in the present. To be in the presence of God is to be totally in the present moment where you are. Be here now, like the old books in the 60s, you know? Be here now. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with the ability to learn and know. And that comes from being in the moment, being in the now. Oh, my gosh. You got me going here, guy. (laughs) No, that's quite all right. You're really very interesting. What are some of the other topics that you cover in your book? Um, There's a whole chapter on uh, light, uh, which is on eye dilation. You know, the scripture says if that eye be single, the whole body would be full of light. It's referring to the singleness of a dilated eye. If your eye was totally dilated, it would be no double ring. It would be just one single ring. So when it talks about that, it says, you know, if an eye be single, the whole body would be full of light. It's referring to the eye, the eyes themselves. What causes the eyes to dilate? The good book says, what? It says, what sort of things are pure, just, good, lovely? If there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. It's telling you to do what? Dwell on good. Why? Because God is good. Okay. So what does that mean? So if you're dwelling on good, your eyes are going to stay dilated. If you're dwelling on opposite of good, if you're looking and seeing out here hatred and looking out here and seeing everything, everything's wrong, your eyes will constrict. You know, um, Saturn is constriction, Jupiter is expansion. Back to that again, okay? You have a Jupiter conjunct moon. You have a very, very wide open soul. Your, your, your eyes are, I'd love to see your eyes. they, they got to be open. Uh, Jupiter, your soul is very much expanded. That's why Jupiter's there with your moon. But when we're dealing with light, and, uh, you know, when we look at things that are beautiful, a man looks at a beautiful woman, his eyes dilate if he's a heterosexual. So when we look at that thing which is lovely, pure, just, when we keep our eyes and our mind concentrated on these things, our eyes dilate. They don't close down, okay? So if there be any virtue, there be any praise, think on these things. You know, the, the mystery of the scriptures is this. Here's the deepest mystery I can give your listeners. I can spend all day talking about the mysteries, but there's only one profound mystery that will change people's lives, and that's understanding the power of praise and thanksgiving, because it, within that contains all the mysteries you need to know. The scripture says, let the fruit of thy lips be the sacrifice of praise, and in all things give thanksgiving. What does sacrifice mean? Sacrifice means giving up your perception of what's happening out there, your small egotistical view of life. 
pure, finite consciousness of what is good and evil and trusting in the higher good that says all things are working together for good for them that love God. When you get on that level, then you begin to see miracles happen in your life. But you can't manifest those miracles unless you know how to praise and give thanks. The scripture said, people say to me, I remember I had a student one day come up to me and said, Ron, you changed my life. You changed my life. I read your book and it changed my life. I said, really? What changed your life? He said, well, you know, he said, I know what God's will is for my life. I said, really? I said, uh, you got that from my book? And he said, yes. It shows you how you read things and don't really see what you're reading. Even I do the same. And he showed me the scripture that I had written in the book, which says this. that says, says um, uh, rejoice evermore. Now, you try to be joyful all the time. I mean, that would be a challenge. If Royce, you'd be, try, you'd be, be joyful all the time. No, don't anything, let anything get in your way of being joyful. That's your, your chore. The second thing it says is pray without ceasing. The word pray came from the word praise. So the real meaning of that is that you have your hands clasped in prayer all day for 24 hours a day because it says do it unceasingly. It meant praise without ceasing. And then the next thing it says, and in all things give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. So what is his will for us? It's simple. People say, if I knew what God's will was, I'd do it. I say, good. Here it is. You rejoice evermore. Be joyful all the time. Praise without ceasing. And in all things give thanks. That's what he says of us. So why does it say, let the fruit of thy lips be the sacrifice of praise. And in all things give thanksgiving. That's another scripture. Because you're not going to be able to do it from your finite understanding of things. I had a dog run out in front of a car going 50 miles an hour and got splattered. He got thrown about 50 feet. And I remember running over to that dog and seeing my dog that I loved so dearly, beautiful St. Bernard Shepherd, beautiful animal, lying on the cement, bleeding from his nose. And I started cursing, which is a human response. And when I heard myself cursing, I realized I was doing the wrong thing. I'm told that the fruit of my lips should be the sacrifice of praise and in all things, I'm told that all things work together for good for them that love God. Not some things, but everything does. So I had to bring myself up and stop for a moment. And this man stopped his car. He came back. He felt real bad. He hit the car, hit the dog. It wasn't his fault. And he felt very bad. And he sat next to me. And all of a sudden, I realized I had to change my approach and my response to this action. And I just said, praise the Lord. Thank you. Before I said the words, praise the Lord. Thank you. I remember thinking to myself, trying to rationalize why or how it could be good. And I remember thinking, well, maybe I'm being preserved from some future evil. Maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe there's something I don't see in the future that this dog would have attacked a child or done something awful. And anyway, but I try to rationalize my irrational behavior, which is what? Praising and giving thanks for this terrible thing. But I did it anyway, because he says, let it, the sacrifice, the fruit of your lips be the sacrifice of praise. I had to give up my perception of this totally. And I started praising and giving thanks, and guess what happens? The dog jumps up off the cement and starts running. And he runs behind a house, and he gets caught in a fence in the yard, and I get a leash on him. I caught up with him, put a leash on him. He drags me home in a full run. Before we got home, he wasn't even limping. And I'll tell you one more thing. That dog would never get hit by a car again. He was the smartest dog about cars that ever walked this earth. I'm glad to hear that, because I had a cat that wasn't that smart once. I mean... One one day we went out there, cranked our car, and bloop, bloop, bloop. It was in the fan blade. Got cut up pretty bad. Next day we went out there, cranked the car, bloop, 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 and it died the second time. And I never figured out why did that cat go back the very next day. Well, you know, it's not for us to know all those things. It really isn't. It's not about us knowing. It's about just trusting and having faith in what we're told. You know, Paul and Silas were beat, falsely accused, and cast into prison, as Scripture says. Now, if the police bust in your place right now and knock you upside the head a few times and all your people are with you, and they plant drugs on you, and they take you downtown and put you in the in jail. Now, they don't have the privilege of just being in jail. They're put in the hole, the dungeon. What would you do? Would you want to curse them people? Well, I think that's what natural instinct would have you do. And, you know, it's like, it's like you said, though, uh, to me, uh, my job should be to start uh, being nice to people and being thankful for people. And, when you know, it's like Jesus said in the Bible himself, it's easy to thank the people who are 
well, not to use his exact words, but his uh, gist of his conversation, that are giving you tickets to the movie, but not so easy to love the ones that stole your car, in other words. <laughs> Who did you think it needed loving, right? <laughs> right. But, I mean, the, the, the principle's there, in other words. Exactly, exactly. Um, listen to what Paul and Silas did. It said, around midnight, the other prisoners heard him singing praises to God. And immediately their prison opened up and there was an earthquake and their shackles fell off. You say, oh, Ron, that's all about to myth. You know, that happened 2,000 years ago. You don't believe that, do you? I do believe it. Let me tell you my story real quick. I was in prison, I told you, for nine years. And in that nine years, I went before the parole board after nine years, and the parole board said, Ron, we decided you're not ready for parole. We're going to bring you back and talk to you in two years. Now, they have buttons to push underneath their table if, they don't, if, the, if the inmate doesn't take too lightly to what they hear, uh, the news they get there. Uh, but I said, I, remember, I'm, I got to praise and give thanks. How do I praise God and give thanks? He's in the temple that walks them out. Because God dwells in each and every one of you. So how do I praise God if I don't praise him in the man, in the men in front of me? And so I said to them, thank you. And they, I started to turn and walk away. They said, what did you say, Watson? Get back here. What did you say? And I said, I said, thank you, sir. And the head of the parole board said, why did you say thank you? And I said, well, sir, I believe that the years of wisdom on the board is greater than my age, and I'm sure it was the right decision on my behalf, or you wouldn't have made it. Now, what did I just do? I praised them, and I gave them thanks. They looked at each other. as I turned to go again, and they called me back again. And as I called, turned around to look back at them, they were all nodding to each other. They said, we changed our mind, Watson. New York has two armed robberies. They want to take you back first. We're going to release you to their uh, jurisdiction because they have a detainer for you. Well, I went to New York, and the New York judge saw I was in prison nine years, said, you know, you've been naughty, and don't do that again, and can you make two $500 cash bonds? I said, yes, sir, so we'll get out of here, and I beat it for lack of speedy trial. But the point being, it sounded like when the judge, when they told me I was going to go to New York, it sounded like I was jumping out of the pot into the fire. But actually, I ended up being free from that moment. But what was the catalyst that caused that to happen? It was praise and thanksgiving. Praise and thanksgiving. If I can get anything else over to people, I say, I, you know, we, we, re, we spend our lifetime trying to teach our children something called responsibility. But the word's an interesting word. It means ability to respond, responsibility. And the, the, the mystery of life is that once you begin to understand there's only three responses in life. I spent years in prison accusing, hating, fighting, hating myself and hating others. Then I spent years with apathy and despair because I didn't care anymore. That's the second response. You can accuse. Bob Fine, remember what the devil's called? Satan, the devil, the serpent's called the accuser of our brother. And he who accused our brother before God will come night. By the way, you can't, you can't be loving and love others if you're self-accusing. That's why the scripture says a man who loves his wife loves himself. And how do you love yourself? You have to forgive yourself for things you've done and the stupidity in your life you've done. So you have to love, love means forgiving. And it starts with yourself, not with just others. So, so, uh, where was I going with all that? So, what are we going to do? We're going to, we're going to, um, my God, I was on a train of thought there and I just got off the track. <laughs> I think you were trying to point out though how important it is to, uh, forgive other people because, uh, it's like Jesus said in his prayer, if you don't forgive others, God can't forgive you and God's inside of you. So, Hey, how do you do it with these inside of you? You got it. You got it, Royce. And the thing I was trying to say was there are three responses to life. You can praise, you can accuse, or you can be apathetic. And I've been through all those things in my life. I spent years being apathetic in prison. I didn't care anymore. I wasn't going to beat them. I couldn't beat them. I wasn't going to join them. I just didn't care anymore. And then finally I learned about praise and thanksgiving. It changed my life. It changed my conditions. It changed everything. And if a person can hear this message, if only one person in that entire audience out there that's listening to your show can get this part of the message, you know, you don't need a chart reading. You need to start praising, giving thanks. Yes, a chart can give you direction and give you a lot of answers. But if you walk in the knowledge and the truth that I'm giving you right now and walk in love, which is manifest. If you love somebody, how do you manifest it? Think about it. If a, if a man loves his wife, does he praise and give thanks? The first sign of a divorce is what? 
finding fault, accusing, constantly finding fault. That's the, the seed of deception and destruction of all things. So if you can begin praising, giving thanks, trusting in good, seeing yourself in the light of truth and light, and begin to forgive yourself and others, your life will change. And you'll be lifted up amongst men. And you'll start seeing great things happening in your life. Okay. Uh, a, little, a little long on that, uh, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've still got about 15 minutes left before wrapping. And we actually, uh, we've gone almost two hours on the show. And it's it's been a pretty lively discussion, I think. But we had a question in the chat room. James was asking, uh, he says, how does this guy rectify his belief in God and the Bible and stuff with being an astrologer? Astrologer, because the Bible says basically that uh, the stuff is evil. And he said, I don't believe this, but the Bible teaches against it. And he uh, also wants to know, have you run into conflicts with religious people over being an astrologer? Um, to answer the question, I, the first part of the show, I don't know if James heard it or not, when I talked about astrology and the scriptures. Oh, he, was, uh, in there. he came in late. Yeah, he came in late, so he didn't hear all that. Uh, we had a long discussion about it at the beginning about astrology in the Bible. The three wise men were astrologers. Uh, the Christians don't want to acknowledge that. They call them magi, but they have to acknowledge it in the new uh, translations. They were astrologers, and uh, they led us to the cradle of Christ. Uh, the purpose of astrology, in my mind, is to lead us to the cradle of divine realization. That's where it is. Um, astrology is throughout the scripture. The New Age is about astrology. The the sign of the Son of Man appearing in heaven is not a man climbing down out of a cloud, coming down and uh, and rescuing everybody that's been good and uh, leaving the rest of us to suffer in hell. The, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven is Aquarius. We talked about that earlier. Uh, uh, in the last days, he'll do what? He says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on and on and on. And it's who's pouring out the spirit? It's Aquarius. The sign of Aquarius. It said, His coming to me is a lightning that shineth in the east and is seen in the west. What is that referring to? An astronomical sign. It's the sign of Aquarius. It's the age we're now moving into. So much is here. We've been discussing this in link on the show, so if you came in late, James, that might be hard to comprehend what I'm calling. As far as what other people think about me, um, you know, there's a saying I learned when I was a young man that I've never lost, and I've lived by it, and it's helped me out through a lot in life. I was in a restaurant with a beautiful girl that I had uh, went to an extraordinarily expensive uh, French restaurant. And I was in my early 20s, um, and I was trying to impress this girl, and uh, I went way overboard and went to a place that I really shouldn't be in and couldn't afford. But it was one of these very fancy French restaurants with nature d's everywhere, people putting footstools in front of you and giving you hot towels to wipe your face, and on and on. And, and uh, so I sit down in this beautiful restaurant, and the girl – just sits there for a minute, and out of the, I just out of the blue, she just starts throwing up, and it went out like a, I mean, like a hose all over the place, and it was pretty disgusting in a very high class restaurant for what happened. And the maitre d' came over to me, and he saw how disconcerted certain I was and how upset I was, and where my, you know, my embarrassment. He saw it right away, and he said something to me I've never forgot to this day, as he cleaned up the mess. He said, son, he said, them that matter don't care. And them that care don't matter. And I've lived my life with that. You know, um, people, I, I'm very open about my past. I'm about my background. And people would say, have a hard time with it. That's their problem. You know, it's not my problem. You know, them that care don't matter. Them that matter don't care. And what I've learned in life is that, uh, you know, you know, you be true to thyself as much follows the day, the, the night, the day, thou canst and be false any man. I try to be as truthful as I can and be as honest and open about my life as I can because I came out of those experiences and who I am came out of those experiences and I'm thankful for them. So I don't know if I've answered your question or not, but, uh, you know, if you really want to know the truth about astrology and scriptures, read my book, The Greatest Story Never Told. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, it's by Ron Watson. It's my name. And uh, I hope you'll read it, Jim, and it'll give you great insights into the mysteries. Well, I got to tell you, Ron, I like your attitude because, you know, from my perspective personally, uh, I feel like, hey, a person has to be true to himself. It doesn't matter who agrees or doesn't agree because in the end, if you can't be true to yourself, then you're not going to be true to God. And if you can't be true to God, you can't have a relationship with God as he seeks people who worship him in spirit and in truth. 
So I think it's important to be true to yourself. It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Let God tell you if you're right or wrong. You worry about being true. Well said, well said. You know, when I was in prison um, uh, in Texas, I was in Texas. I was in several prisons, but I was serving time on the installment plan because when they caught me, I was wanted in seven states. Uh, but when I was in Texas, I was studying all these religions, uh, different ones, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Jehovah Witness, uh, Catholicism, um, you know, anything that, because inside prison, everybody's got a, a mission, and that's to preach to those that are in prison, okay? That's part of their ministry. And so I had access to a lot of books and different things, and I was reading everything, trying to find the answer. And one night after working out in the cotton fields all day, I was laying on my bunk, and my my cellmate was laying on the bunk below me. I was on the top bunk. And I'll never forget this experience. And I remember I set the book down on my chest that I was reading, and I just had a prayer. I was so fatigued by everybody claiming they had the only way to God, and everybody was wrong if they didn't believe like they did. And um, I laid the book down on my chest, and I said a little prayer. I just I said, Lord, I'm so weary of this. I said, just give me a sign, and I'll follow it. Tell me what which one's right, and I'll go by that way, you know. And as I said that little prayer, the, I, I experienced something that was so magical and so powerful that it just transformed my life. The light came into that cell, and it was so bright. And from, not only was there light, but I heard a word spoken to me. But not only was the word spoken to me, I experienced the word. I felt it. It was it, it, it filled my being. And the word was love. And um, the light was so bright in that cell. And I remember the scripture came to my mind immediately after that experience. And it said this. It says, in this you shall know if you're my disciples or not, and that you have love one for another. And I remember looking down at my cellmate, and, and I didn't say anything to him. He said to me, he said, Watson, did you see that? And I said, what did you see? He said, didn't you see the light in the cell? And I said, yeah, I did. I said, did you notice anything else? And he says to me, yeah, Ron. He says, I feel really good. So whatever, it, my, my rational mind would have analyzed that whole thing and said it was just a subjective experience. But when he said, did you see it, and he felt it, I knew that what happened in that cell was real. It wasn't just a subjective experience. And uh, I, mean, I remember him making a joke about, oh, they must have just burned somebody. You know, <laughs> this is a Texas State Penitentiary. And, uh, of course, they electrocute a lot of people there. But the lights don't go dim like in the movies. <laughs> they have their own generators. Okay. But anyway, but I remember that comment. He made a joke about it. So what I'm saying to you is that, you know, James out there asked a question, you know, about religion. I, I don't have any question with it anymore. I don't struggle with it. If someone comes to me with their belief that I'm going to go to hell if I don't believe the way they do, I say, look, at you know, this good book tells me this. Is, it simply says, in this you shall know if you're my disciples or not, in that you have love one for another. I live by that. That's my philosophy. That's my belief. That's That's my theology. Everything else, you can take it and do what you want with it. It's dogma. Okay? Dogma. You know, dogma is spelled backwards? Uh, actually, I never thought about it. It's in God. The scripture says, know you not that you are God. God dwells within you. You're the temple of living God. The people that are most dogmatic have the hardest time with that scripture. Okay? That you am, that I am God. That God is within me. Not in some egotistical way, a messi messianic way but in the truth way and an understanding that you're the temple of the living God. You know, that he dwells in the temple. You know what's on both sides of you, up next to your eyes is your temples. The temples. Your temple. And within those temples dwells God. Anyway. You know, that's another interesting concept I never thought of before about the temples there. Uh, you know, everybody knows that the sides of your head is called the temples right there uh, <laughs> on the other side of your eye. But whoever thinks about the uh, passage in the Bible... And that and makes the connection. Well, read my book, my friends. I, I'll tell you something. Everybody out there, you want to read a book that will revolutionize your thinking. It will wake you up to so many things that have never been revealed, okay? And I mean that. Oh, so, I believe you know, that. I really do. <laughs> yeah. So I've had, uh, you know, like I said, I'm not a scholar, and I'm not about boasting or something like that. But I can tell you this. Two of the top scholars in the world, one of them is a Hebrew scholar, a Jewish scholar, I uh, have written reviews, they're both in the book, about this book and praised it. So, you know, I, all I can say is this, that it's out there if you want it, if you're really seeking, you're looking for answers. It's not another metaphysical book about positive thinking. 
it's a book that'll change your life. It'll change your whole approach to life. And it'll give you answers that will open doors of extraordinary life giving, loving experiences. Okay. So Well, do you have any other things coming up in the near future that are you working on any other books or anything else you'd like to tell my listeners about? You know, I'm not working on anything else. I, I really want to see this book promoted and get get out there as much as I can because it's a, a message for mankind. And I, I really, until I started writing a book some years back called What You See Is What You Get, and um, and it turns out I lost the chapters of it and I, when I was moving and I never did find it, so I said, that's okay. I wasn't meant to write it, I guess. But, you know, I have one chapter in my book is basically that. It's on the word and how powerful it is and what it can do to create or destroy your life. Once you begin to manage, manifest control over that, manage to control your words, stop cursing or accusing. And the real curses are not damn and hell. You know, the curses are he makes me sick and tired. I'm tired and sick of this. Or uh, he's a pain in the ass. Or, you know, I'm breaking, breaking back. Or, you know, I could go on and on, you know. Uh, he's a pain in the ass, and, you know, why do you have hemorrhoids, you know? You you can create your own reality. You can create your own diseases. You can create your own state of health or lack of it just by understanding your relationship to the word. And um, there's so much uh, there's so much to share. Uh, the, the, the chapter on the star, the star of the Magi, it's essentially on praise and thanksgiving. Um, the chapter on the eyes and eye dilation and, um, and, and understanding how consciousness is reflected in the eyes. You know, the old days in uh, China, the old gym buyers used to go to China to buy stones and precious stones, and they could never understand them. As soon as they saw a stone they liked, it seemed like the price always went up. <laughs> that does sound and, like America, too, doesn't it? Uh-huh, exactly. <clears throat> Well, what happened was uh, those old gym, gym sellers were very smart. They would just watch the eyes. And as soon as the eyes dilated, they knew that that was a stone they liked. Because when you look at good, you see something good or lovely or attractive, your eyes will dilate. So if an eye be single, a whole body is full of light. What's that mean? It means the singleness of an eye, a single eye that's dilated totally. So they saw these eyes dilate, and they, all of a sudden that price would go up for that stone. And those gym sellers, or gym buyers, right, they could never understand how these people always had it up on them. It's like when you see these card players down and, uh, you know, playing poker, how many of them are wearing sunglasses? They're trying to protect their eyes because if the person's smart, they're going to watch those eyes and they'll see if they get a full hand, a flush, a royal flush, their hand, their eyes going to dilate. They can't help it. It's an autonomic response. So they wear sunglasses that hide their eyes so that nobody can see what their, their, their reaction on the pupil is. Okay. So, so we're, you know, we're dealing with so much here. We're dealing with, Physiology, psychology, mythology, that's what the book's about. Mythology, psychology, scriptures, uh, it, it, it deals with so many subjects. Each chapter in itself is a subject of its own. It could live alone. And uh, I invite everybody to get a copy of it. You know, if you need my cell number, if you, or I'll give you I'll give my 800 number. You can call me anytime if you want to order a book, or you can get it through Kindle or through uh, Amazon. My phone number is uh, 800-382. Four six six seven. Uh, that's uh, toll free one eight hundred three eight two four six six seven. If you'd like to schedule an astrological uh, session with me, I'm open for that too. So that's something that's available as well. I also have uh, uh, CD albums that are available on different subjects, different lectures from astrology, mythology, and scriptures, uh, which is um, astrology in the Bible. I've got a CD on that, an hour lecture. I've got one called The Mystical Marriage and How to Find and Keep a Perfect Relationship in Your Life. And uh, it's called The Mystical Marriage. Um, and the other one is called uh, The Word is Made Flesh. It's actually called um, Guilt and Forgiveness. I've got uh, five and a six CD collections that are available as well. So anyway, we could uh, go on and on with this. But I, I hope that the listeners will get one thing out of this whole session. And that is that it's not important in life what happens to us. The most important thing is how you respond to it. And if I can teach you perfect response, I can teach you to change and transform your life. If you begin praising, giving thanks for what you're not cursing and trusting in good and not believing in a lie and deception that you're being separated from good or God, your life will be transformed and you'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. 
So, you know, the scripture says there's only one unpardonable sin. I remember reading that in the Bible, and I used to think, God, I hope blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. I used to say, I hope I've done everything else. I haven't done this one. But, you know, the unpardonable sin is this. The blasphemy in me is a cursor. The Holy the Holy Ghost is what it said. That's when we get to the Holy Ghost, I believe. The Holy Ghost is, the Holy Ghost is integrated con- the subconscious mind. The Holy Spirit is the conscious mind. Okay? So the Holy Spirit would be uh, integrated conscious mind. The place where ghost visions and apparitions come from is the subconscious mind. I mean, if I hypnotize somebody and I put them in a trance and I tell them they're going to see a cat walking across the room, they're going to see a ghost of a cat, and they're going to believe it's a cat. I remember in the Navy hypnotizing a guy and telling him that he was going to see seeing flying saucers to starboard on a ship and watch when I was in the Navy. And when he was up on the bridge serving his watch, guess what he did? He called the captain, set up the alarm. He saw flying saucers to starboard. I almost got a court-martial over that. I thought it was funny, but they didn't. But anyway, so the point being is that's ghosts. Where do ghost visions and apparitions come from? The subconscious mind, the soul, or if you were the Holy Ghost, a ghost. Okay. So the only unpardonable sin is the blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost meaning your subconscious. So what does that mean? If you curse the subconscious, if I put a seed, if I keep saying over and over and over again, he's a pain in the ass, and repeat it enough times, my subconscious gets that message. And the seed is planted, and it's unpardonable because it's going to produce a result. And the result's going to be pain in my rectum, quite frankly. It's probably going to be, be anything. It could be hemorrhoids to cancer. Or if I say I'm sick and tired of you all the time, I'm going to end up with those problems. So it's unpardonable because I plant the seed in the Holy Ghost in the subconscious mind. What happens? It produces a result, one that I'm not too happy about. So, you know. All right. Well, I got to tell you, I'm glad you said what you did, but it really could lead into a whole nother discussion about the uh, difference between the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. Because until you said that, I always thought that they were interchangeable, and that the ancients just used them interchangeably. I had no idea that they were actually referring to something different until you told me tonight. Well, you know, in my book, I have the the uh, a whole chapter on that that deals with it. It's called the uh, the Holy Trinity and man, it deals with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. The old days they called the Holy Spirit Ruk, and the Holy Ghost was called Nefesh. And the physical body was symbolized by the cross, which is where we suffer. Okay, so whatever the spirit or the soul was the same. The spirit was the Holy Spirit, if it's holy or integrated, and the, uh, the soul was the Holy Ghost. You know, you, you know, you remember the old prayer, um, if I shall die before I wake, I hope the Lord my soul to take. That's what goes on after you die. I've seen people lose their soul. They lost it. It's gone. They disappeared. It won't stay party. It won't be party to what those people are about. And I knew people in prison that had lost their souls. They had no soul, no feelings, no compassion at all. That's what the soul is about. Okay? So the scripture says there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's like saying a psychologist saying there's, you've got a conscious and a subconscious mind, but they're really one. How do we separate them? They're one. But yet they are two. Okay? Mary said, she said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoiceth in God. Notice she refers to the difference between the soul and the spirit. Okay? So the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is the soul. The Holy Spirit is the, is the conscious conscious mind. Uh, the, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing of sunder, dividing the sunder of soul and spirit. That's scripture again, talking about that. And it also okay. says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. How beautiful. That is the sum of it all right there. You, you summed up the whole message of this. And uh, there's one more thing I'll say to you, and that is that um, the scripture says this is what our jo- what our job is to do. Okay, when we talk about the soul and the spirit, listen to the scripture. Seeing you have purified your souls, again the subconscious, in obeying the truth through the spirit, unto unfeigned love of thy brethren. And notice what it's saying: you purify your souls by doing what? Obeying what truth? The truth is, you know it. 
is showing unfeigned love of your brother. What does unfeigned mean? Not fake. That's First Peter 22, 122. It said, you see, you purified your souls. I tell people, they, they come to my sessions, my lectures, my workshops, and they say, you know, your real job in life is to purify your soul. There's a lot of crap that's been put in there already, you know, sometimes by your parents. You know, you grow up with these things, you know. People put things in our subconscious mind because they're ignorant, okay? They tell us things we wish we hadn't, hadn't bought as a, as a child. I mean, it's like being around a doctor who says, oh, you know, everybody's going to have problems at this time of age. You're going to have a lot of problems. I mean, it's a doctor and an authority figure, so what does the subconscious say? It buys into that, okay? Or your parents tell you things like, don't go outside without a coat, a coat on. You'll catch the death of pneumonia. Well, that's not true. But you have people tell their children these things, don't they? So we were brought up with a lot of incorrect information in our souls, in our subconscious. Our job is to purify it. People come to me. I've had, I was lecturing at the National Health Federation one time, and a woman in the back of the room, she raised her hand. She said, Ron, I think it's all great, but how, I can't, what about all the stuff that's already put in my mind that I can't do anything about? I said, you purify it by constantly putting in more clean and good things. I said, if you have a cup of coffee, and it's dark with coffee, and you want to make it pure water, you can't take the coffee and separate it from the water, but you can keep putting pure water in that cup until it begins to, what, purify itself. Eventually, the purity, the pure water will overcome the polluted water. Okay? So it's the same with the subconscious mind. It's the same type of truth, okay? Okay. All righty. Okay. Well, you know, listen, Royce, right, so we could go on all night because I, I once I get started, I don't want to stop. But I, I swear right. to God, this has been a, a wonderful experience. Uh, I really enjoyed it. You're an amazing host. Uh, I've never had a host that uh, opened the door to so much communication from its, uh, its guests as you did. And uh, I thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure and a real joy to be on the show with you. And uh, I hope your listeners got something from it. And uh you know, it was fun doing the readings. Maybe someday we can just do a show on that and concentrate on that instead of the other things. But it was a real pleasure, and I thank you. Well, I want to thank you for coming on to the show, and you've likewise been one heck of a guest. You've uh, actually opened my eyes to a few things, uh, a few concepts I hadn't put in quite the way that they were put to tonight. And I thought we made really good uh, chemistry together during this show. And I was going to ask you, would you be willing to come back in the future? Oh, of course I would. I would enjoy that very much. All righty. Well, it's seven minutes after now, so I kind of tend to agree with you. It's getting kind of late, and i got to get John off to school at least until about the next six or seven days when he gets out for summer. And I'm going to keep your information, and I'm going to stay in touch with you if that's okay with you. All right, Royce. Well, listen, thanks to the listeners as well for being there and listening tonight. And uh, it's been a real pleasure, and I, I look forward to a future uh a future session with you. Thanks so much, Royce. Okay, Good you night. too now. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Okay, everybody. Let's make sure I didn't accidentally disconnect myself. I showed it's still beyond. And um, real quick, like, I want to remind everybody... UFO Day is coming up here July the 2nd, I think it is. If you look on the right-hand side in the upper corner, uh, you'll see World UFO uh, Day, uh, or yeah, icon there, logo there. Give her a click and check her out. Don't forget to visit my friends over at, um, well, let me open up the friends page and read them off the banner as I come because I'm tired and my mind's not clicking. Alien and UFO Community, which is a social network. Supernatural UFO, which is a forums. And United Paranormal International, which is also a social network. And they're all great places. They're great for information. They each have a lot of people. They're active. Uh, a lot of discussions going on. I think you really enjoy it over there. And then there's my friends at the UKPN Radio, Gary Brown who's been on my show before, Jim Harold, the host of True uh, Stories Around the Camp, uh, Campfire, which has been on before, and then there's Micah Hanks of the Grinning Report, and he will be here this Saturday at 1 for his third time on my show, and I really recommend listening to the Grinning Report. Uh, Micah's a good friend of mine, and he's a fantastic host, and he's a great author. I've actually read his book. It's very interesting. And then there's Ohio Exopolitics Radio with Mark Hamill, 
who is also a friend of mine, and I think you'll like his show if you stop by there. And don't forget to join us Saturday. Please tell your friends to stop by and check out the show and let them know that they sign up for free membership. They can get into the chat. And if we all work together, maybe we can get a bigger crowd in the chat room and have more chat going on. In the meantime, folks, I'm going to call it quits right there and go meet with my wife and get ready for bed. Thank you very much and have a good night. Oh, also, one more thing before I disconnect. I almost forgot. I want to thank everybody for listening. I couldn't have a show without my listeners any more than I could without my guests. And I want to thank you all for your participation in the show. And I look forward to having more in the future. Thank you very much, and you all have a good night. Now, um, I made many prophecies about the economics and them that are born in this generation are going to be brought to want, which is happening as you see it around you right now. Uh, all around the world, the economy is collapsing. I said that the currencies would collapse around the world, and they are. Um, you know, and I've been, with some of these predictions, I remember my wife, who I've been married to 22 years, uh, who's from Moscow, and she used to say, oh, Ron, I, can't, I just don't believe that thing about, you know, the, America it can't be. You know, America is a great country, and I don't see how it could, um, you know, be brought to its knees economically. And um, unfortunately, um, I... I'm getting to a point where she's beginning to see it and uh, and see the reality of it. And, but, you know, there's so much here. I, I don't want to get long-winded on it, but, uh, I mean, I'm very evangelical about it. I think that uh, the people have a right to know the truth. Um, I know that um, – I do know that when I wrote my book, uh, I had – even when I talked about in the, in the last days when we talked about knowledge shall be increased in those days, who would have known – who would have known the instant access to knowledge that everyone has today? I mean, if you look at this as Aquarius as I know is the key word. We've been in, I believe, for the last 2,000 years, which is the sign of Pisces, the belief age. And so we've had believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. All things are possible in the name of the belief. You know, belief, belief, belief. It's all been for the last 2,000 years. Water baptism, which is Pisces, a water sign. Fish Friday, the sign of the fish, Pisces. Uh, um, the... Um, uh, 12 disciples, the 12 sign Pisces, the uh, uh, fishers of men, which the disciples were called, that's all Piscean. Uh, uh, anyway, we can get into all that. But there, the thing is, Aquarius, who would have ever thought, even when I was writing my book in the 70s, uh, uh, who would have thought that when it said knowledge shall be increased in those days, that anyone can get on a computer today, and even on their little smartphone, and access any kind of information instantly, within a millisecond almost. They can find any kind of information about anything there is. They can find knowledge on any subject that exists. And uh, who would have known that could happen in this day and age? I mean, it's amazing when you think about it, that that involvement of the access to knowledge has come so far in just a few a uh, couple of decades, really. Right. And, uh, what, you know, and we're heading for even better things, so in terms of that. The problem with knowledge is uh, it's not always combined with wisdom. There's a, you know, knowledge is proud, it knows so much. Uh, wisdom is humble, it knows so little. And knowledge can be a hurtful thing as well as a good thing. So let's, let's hope that's that true. To good use. That's exactly the key, too, is the use of it. Well, listen, my wife is one of the people in the chat room wanting to know if you're going to be doing any readings because she wants one. And also, in addition to that, I was wanting to bring up to you because what you said about the uh, water bearer a minute ago is that I'm familiar with some work by, I think her name was Akira Smith and also uh, Malik Jabbar and a few others. Uh, There was an old, old writer that is also, uh, I want to say his name was Kelsey or something, that has done work on the... uh, Birth of Christ and its uh, astrological symbology uh, that was really meant. And the thing always ends up... I, I, I was one of these young people that thought I knew it all. And, um, you know, I, I'd read in the dictionary, it's a pseudoscience. So, of course, I just wrote it off as being nothing to it. But that put me on the journey, Royce, and that's where I stayed for nine solid through the years. I studied. I had a captive clientele. Nobody went anywhere. So... I was able to, and I have plenty of time, so I, I spent hours and hours every day studying and researching. And out of those uh, nine years when I was released, uh, 
1972, uh, I wrote the book for the next year. Um, and uh, I had really discovered a lot of amazing mystery uh, mysteries that had never been revealed. And I really understood that uh, uh, that I had tapped into some knowledge that had been kept from the masses. And uh, that put me on the journey. And I've had a wonderful life since then. I've, uh, I've hosted my own radio shows for years in San Francisco, San Diego, and Los Angeles. Uh, had syndicated radio talk shows all over the United States. Uh, um, uh, you know, I, I was vice president of a major corporation in this country. I've done very well. I've been successful. But those those nine years were where my astrology came from. So that's what you get for asking. <laughs> well, do you still do your radio shows, though? You know, I don't now. Um, we moved to Florida two years ago, and uh, uh. we moved to yeah, we moved to Boston actually um, um, about nine years ago. We spent six years in Boston, then we moved here. So I was kind of dislocated from California and, and stopped doing the shows. But you know, I really have a. Uh, I do a lot of lecturing and teaching. I just gave a lecture last week to the Theosophical Society in Miami here. And, um, you know, I have a love for sharing and um, and spreading the truth because I really have uh, found that people, if once they understand the profundity of the knowledge and what's coming and the ages and what they're about and how we're now entering the Aquarian Age, uh, you know, people talk about this, but, you know, the Aquarian Age is the age of knowledge. Right. I remember... That's spoken you know, about remember. in the Bible about uh, he'll pour out his spirit in those days. I think Amos said it, didn't he? Um, actually, um, in Matthew it says that. It says, uh, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I think it was in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's what I thought I, thought I remembered. Yeah, it is. It is. Yes, you're right. Uh, Joel, I think you're right. Yeah. And the, the thing is that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prosper. You old, old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions, and upon my hand means too in those days, I'll pour out my spirit, and they too shall prophesy. But the other part of that scripture that's overlooked very often is another scripture that says, in the last days, not only will I pour out my spirit, but it says, when the sign of the Son of Man appears in heaven. Which will be the sign of Aquarius. Exactly, the sign of the man. The only sign in the zodiac of a man is Aquarius. There's the Gemini, there's the twins, there's... uh, my sign, uh, Sagittarius, which is half horse and half man, uh, when it's not a half ass and half man, but <laughs> anyway. So there's only really one sign of a man, and he's pouring out the spirit, the living waters that Christ spoke of, and that's what um, the prophecy is about. That's interesting. And, you know, you know, when I wrote the book, um, years ago, uh, I made many prophecies about these days and what's coming, and most of it's unfolding right now. Uh, saw that he was a practitioner of these um, uh, metaphysical subjects. He, in fact, um, not, was not only an interpreter of dreams, which uh, uh, preserved the pharaoh of Egypt eventually, uh, but he also, uh, the, the scripture says that the stars bowed down in obeisance to him, meaning that he understood them and he interpreted them and he understood them. Um, if you go into uh, the Psalms, it says the sun shall not smite the, uh, the by day nor the moon by night. Well, I've heard of uh, sunstroke. I've never heard of moonstroke. But, uh, you know, I don't know how the moon can smite thee if, uh, if it has no influence. So we could keep on doing this. Uh, there's a scripture in Psalms that says, uh, uh, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And the original intention and translation of that word, uh, that sentence, was not the heavens. It was the planets declare the glory of God, and the heavens showeth its handiwork. And then it went on to say, and night unto night showeth knowledge, and day unto day uttereth speech. And there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And moreover, in keeping them is their great reward, and by them is thy servant warned. So... What is that? You know, it says that there's no voice or language where their voice is not heard. Astrology is the only universal language. It spoke to the same, pretty much the symbols are knowledgeably understood in every country of the world, not just in this country. So, you know, I can talk to an Indian astrologer. He may use a different uh, uh, system, a sidereal system, where I'll use a tropical, but we still understand each other very well when we talk astrology. Uh-huh. Uh, and so, anyway... So we could do this uh, for hours. There's so much astrology. And when, when we get to the most vital part of this is that the early Christians 
if they understood what they're reading in the New Testament, they would be uh, have no choice but to uh, embrace astrology. First of all, um, I say to people that reject astrology, I say they probably would have ran the three wise men out of town when they were around if they were there then, because the three wise men were astrologers. Yeah, I've read that. And so, you know, they, they they interpreted the books of Magi, but the actual original intent was astrologers, and they followed the star. Of course they followed the star, but they didn't follow a star in the sky. They had the astrological chart of the child, and they knew he'd be born in a propitious time in a particular place. And that star was the five-pointed star <laughs> inside of a chart of a child. It wasn't a star in the sky. That's why here it said he looked for it for two years. He couldn't find it. So um, what the Christians will do, they'll turn astrology um, against um, against astrology by saying, well, if it hadn't been for the wise men, um, uh, Herod wouldn't have slew all the children under two years old. Um, you know, so they'll try to make something. Well, but that was he was planning to do it before the wise men come along. Oh, sure. If he knew a leader was going to rise up, he was going to do that. So yep. there's so much here. In fact, um, um, I'll give you some more scriptures. Uh, we could do this all night, but I'll give you well, some more scriptures. I was going to say before we go into that, though, uh, why don't you real quick, like, tell everybody what was it that kind of got your interest in this particular subject? Oh, great. That's a long one. Um, well, <laughs> let me, I'm very frank, I'm very outspoken, and I'm very um, upfront about how I ended up where I am. Okay. Um, I started, I started, uh, I started studying astrology um, and spent um, really nine solitary years studying it uh, in a modesty existence. Um, what happened was in my early 20s, um, 50 years ago, to give you some idea of my age, um, 50 years ago, um, uh, I was the most wanted man in the United States. I was wanted in New York, Maryland, Virginia, Ohio, Texas, and Michigan for armed robberies. And I was a pretty wild, crazy young kid and um, got myself in a deep amount of trouble in the early period of my life. And uh, uh, for that, I ended up spending nine years in prison. <clears throat> in those nine years, I remember uh, when I went in, I recall they gave me a psychological test and they asked uh, questions such as a father uh, or my father. And then they would say a mother and, this, and another one was this place. And you were supposed to fill in whatever came to your mind when you uh, saw these things. And... I put. I remember writing, my father is dead, because I never knew my real father. And then I wrote, a mother is a woman who suffers from the fruits of her pleasure, um, because my mother was married nine times and didn't want to be a mother, and she obviously didn't want to raise me and my my sister. So, you know, and but the thing that I did write that was quite interesting was um, uh, probably a prescience of knowledge in deep in my soul that I knew why I was there. And when it came to the words, this place, I remember writing, this place reminds me of a monastery. So I think in my deeper soul of my being, even though I had no religious concepts or thoughts of religion, I was pretty much a, I don't know, as agnostic or atheistic, it doesn't matter, but I, I surely didn't have a belief system that would monitor anything. I was pretty lost. Um, but I must have at some point in my being known that this was going to be a monastic existence for me and that it was going to serve a larger purpose uh, than it was just to go to prison. And so I spent nine years in prison. And during those years, um, I studied astrology. Um, I didn't start out that way. I, I went in there, and there was, a, um, there was a beautiful black man named Percy John Newton who um, did my chart. And he knew so much about me, I was just shocked. I couldn't believe anybody could do that with a chart. And, uh, and then what happened was um, um, I had a friend that lived in Virginia who uh, um, had a baby. She was a uh, very young girl, 17 years old, married to a um, uh, not not very good person, uh, a guy that was a, a alcoholic and abusive. And... Um, she did the chart of the baby when it was born because she sent me, uh, the young girl sent me her uh, birth chart of the birth time of the child. As it turns out, <clears throat> he wrote on the calendar, uh, the mother of the child will die within six days of the birth of this child. And uh, I really didn't believe it. But, because, but I thought possibly the child who was born premature 
might might not live, but I didn't really think about the mother. And as it turned out, um, literally six days to the hour and the minute, the mother died of an asthma attack while in the hospital, not being treated for her asthma. And she died six days to the minute and hour of that birth of that child, exactly as he foretold it. So that's when I really began to look at astrology. I said, there's more to this than anyone I've ever seen. Welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, where truth equals reality, and truth is often stranger than fiction. Hello everyone, welcome to Paranormal Palace Radio, this is your host, Royce the Redneck uh, Radio Man, and joining me today is Mr. Ron Watson, and we're going to be discussing his book, The Greatest Story Never Told. And this book really caught my attention over on Amazon uh, when I was reading the description of it because it goes into detail about a lot of things about the early church that's not exactly common knowledge. But I've done some research on myself, and I know that he's right about this. And it's stuff that it's a, what's a favorite topic of mine. And I always love to give anybody that knows something about this a chance to come out here and share. And I've also seen a YouTube video of the man, and it really impressed me. It was either YouTube or one of the other videos. I can't remember which because when I saw it, it was like a month or two ago when I first scheduled them. Uh, my show being scheduled two months in advance at the minimum right now for, uh, I can forget a video between now and then. Um, but why don't we introduce him and let him tell us what got his interest in this. And the man's also in astrology, and I'm not certain if he had planned on doing any uh, readings or uh, anything of that nature tonight. Uh, but if somebody calls in, you can always ask and see what he says. So, Ryan, I want to thank you for coming to the show tonight. It's a real pleasure to meet you and have you here. Well, it's my pleasure to be there, and I uh, really thank you for inviting me. And I um, look forward to a lively discussion on the subject of the book and uh, astrology, mythology, and scriptures. Essentially, that's what I um, lecture and teach on. Well, you know, I'm going to have a guest coming up. At the end of this month, I got his description on the front page already. Uh, Malik Jebar, I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And if I'm not, I hope you don't get mad at me. But he's got some books out that talks about um, the astrological foundation of Christianity. So I didn't know if maybe you uh, had some knowledge in that part of it, too, as well. Um, that's what I lecture and teach on, and that's what my book's about. Um, most people don't realize how much um, astrology is in the scriptures. Most people, in fact, the Christian community uh, would have you believe that it's um, uh, anti-Christian to be into astrology or to look into it or to even uh, involve yourself with it. But uh, they have suppressed for you uh, the knowledge, but it's still there. And if you've got eyes to see and ears to hear, you can still discern what the early Christians were trying to tell us. Um, I can give you some simple scriptures that uh, can make that clear. Um, nearly in the Old Testament, it said the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Now, Sisera was a captain in the army, uh, and he lost the battle. Now, I, I, I don't know how you can write something such as the stars in their courses fought against him if they have no influence. Um, in Genesis, it said that he created the sun, the moon, the stars for signs. And for seasons, not just for seasons, but for signs and for seasons. Uh, Joseph, um, his brothers hated him so much uh, because uh, uh, they, they, they 